Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the ultimate Nintendo iceberg. This video features 200 different facts and stories about Nintendo. Starting off at the top of the iceberg with stuff you might have heard of before, but as we get deeper, the facts get more and more unknown until we get to the final section of the iceberg, which is absolutely unhinged. This video features everything from a Nintendo secret that was hidden for over 28 years, a third Mario brother, dozens of Nintendo's craziest controversies, and so, so much more. This is by far the biggest project we've ever undertaken, so a like and subscribe would be appreciated beyond words, and now let's jump into the first section of the iceberg, the sky. L is real. In Super Mario 64, the courtyard in Peach's castle has this statue of a star. On its plaque is blurry text that many fans are convinced reads L is real 2401. Immediately, fans believed that L stood for Luigi, and Mario 64 players began trying to decipher this message to unlock Mario's famous brother. Players thought that collecting 2,401 coins would make Luigi appear, or that running around the statue that many times would unlock him, but no. Unfortunately, this plaque is just a generic asset Nintendo used. However, in 2020, Nintendo experienced a Giga Leak that revealed tons of classified information. Among this data was a Super Mario 64 model for Luigi. The Giga Leak dropped in July of 2020, exactly 24 years and one month after Super Mario 64's release. Turns out L was real 2401. DK Rap. One of the weirdest Nintendo published games ever is Donkey Kong 64. Donkey Kong's only 3D platformer is a bizarre title, and it only makes sense that when you boot up the game, you're introduced to the DK crew by the DK Rap. This song is absolutely bizarre. Composed by Grant Kirkhope, the game's composer, this satirical, somewhat comedic rap has become infamous for its goofy lyrics and dubious quality. Kirkhope has come on record saying that he was not intending to make a serious rap, but that didn't stop his coworkers from making fun of him for the song, and Grant stated that his tombstone will read, Here lies the body of Grant Kirkhope. He wrote the DK rap, May God have mercy on his soul. The DK rap was also featured in the Super Mario Bros. movie, as Donkey Kong's entrance theme. However, sadly, Kirk Hope was not credited in the film, despite being the song's composer. My body is ready. It's E3 2007, and the DS and Wii systems are in full swing, selling incredibly. Nintendo announces release dates for Super Mario Galaxy and Super Smash Bros. Brawl. They announce Mario Kart Wii with the Wii Wheel, but showing off a new Smash Bros. 3D Mario or Mario Kart isn't that big of a deal, as Nintendo knows people will buy those games anyway. A demo is much more important for a super experimental title, something like Wii Fit. When demoing Wii Fit for the first time ever in E3 2007, Nintendo goes to show off the body check feature. Calling onto the stage current president of Nintendo of America, Reggie fils he delivers this now iconic line. My you body, ready, my body is ready. <laughs> I... <laughs> My Body is Ready is etched into the Internet Hall of Fame and is one of the most recognizable and memeable quotes of Reggie's long tenured career as Nintendo of America president. Peaches. Peaches is a song sung by Jack Black in the Super Mario Bros. movie. This piano ballad was originally supposed to be a metal tune, which fits more with Black's own band, Tenacious D. Regardless, the piano ballad was a massive success, reaching position number 56 on the Billboard Hot 100, and is even eligible for an Oscar nomination. Satoru Iwata. Satoru Iwata is a former president of Nintendo. He was Nintendo's first president out of the Yamauchi family, and was such a successful president because not only was he a gamer, he was also a programmer and a businessman. On my business card, I am a corporate president. In my mind, I am a game developer. But in my heart, I am a gamer. Using those three hallmarks, he pioneered the Blue Ocean strategy, which helped Nintendo achieve record profits with both the Wii and DS systems. When the company wasn't doing as well, he halved his salary once in 2011 and again in 2014 to not lower employee morale by forcing anyone to get laid off. He left behind a legacy of Awada Ask interviews and Nintendo Directs, revolutionizing the way the fans interacted with the company, and he was dedicated to making sure Nintendo fans got to play the best games possible all the way up until July 11th, 2015, when he passed away from a bile duct tumor. Nintendo Direct. 
Nintendo Directs are just one of the things Iwata left behind, and these are presentations hosted by Nintendo where they deliver information about upcoming games, updates, and consoles directly to you. On Twitter, Nintendo Directs are claimed to be rumored very frequently. In fact, seemingly every January, June, and September, new rumors crop up for Nintendo Directs. That's because they typically air around these months anyway, so many community members pretend to have insider information and make educated guesses on when the next presentation will be. Sega does what Nintendo don't. Sega does what Nintendo don't is an advertising slogan used by Sega in the 1990s. In North America, it changed to Genesis does what Nintendo don't to promote the Sega Mega Drive or Genesis in America. This line was everywhere in the early 1990s, including magazines and TV commercials. Pokemon Go. Pokemon Go is a mobile game developed by Niantic that allows you to capture Pokemon in the real world. It launched on July 5th, 2016 and had crazy publicity right off the start. Immediately, Nintendo's stock skyrocketed, but with the app being a global phenomenon, controversy soon arose. A teenager in Wyoming stumbled across a dead body while searching for Pokemon near a lake mere days after the app launched, and Pokemon Go would somehow be used by both sides in the American 2016. 16 election. TikTok songs. Countless Nintendo songs have experienced massive popularity on the app TikTok. Many Nintendo songs are catchy, nostalgic, and convey a certain emotion really well. This makes them prime to be included as trending sounds on the app, and we've seen examples of this such as Isle Delfino from Super Mario Sunshine, the Mii Channel theme from the Nintendo Wii, and various remixes of Jump Up Superstar from Super Mario Odyssey. Funnily enough, there are many reports of people not understanding that these songs are originally from Nintendo games, which goes to show their ubiquitous nature. Koopa Troopa Dance. In the new Super Mario Bros. games, Koopa Troopas will dance along to the music. This became quite the meme on TikTok, as users began making fun of the fact that Koopas will dance no matter what situation they're in. Matt. In the Wii Sports series of games, Nintendo made a bunch of Miis to act as the CPUs. Matt is by far the most popular and notorious of these Miis. Being the champion in boxing, Matt is considered to be the best possible me. His reputation has arguably outgrown his actual skill, as while Matt is the champion in boxing, Matt is the sixth worst player in tennis and the fifth worst player in baseball. Despite being watched in the other sports, the fact that Matt is the champion in boxing has delivered him a reputation of being the most difficult CPU me in all of Nintendo's games. Nintendo Power. From 1988 to 2012, Nintendo Power was a bi-monthly magazine sent out to Nintendo fans that featured news, facts, stories, and information on upcoming and previous Nintendo releases. Nintendo Power was a massive success in the 90s, and chances are if you were a Nintendo fan back then, you were receiving this publication. Despite its success, its final issue came out in 2012, but the brand lives on as a podcast on Nintendo's YouTube channel. Super Nintendo World. Super Nintendo World is a themed area at select Universal Studios parks. Currently, Super Nintendo World is open at Universal Studios Japan and Universal Studios Hollywood, with areas under construction in Singapore and Epic Universe at Universal Orlando Resort. Despite being named Super Nintendo World, Super Nintendo World almost exclusively focuses on the Mario franchise, with its flagship ride being a Mario Kart attraction. Green Mario. On the Mario Bros. Arcade game, Nintendo had to work with a limited color palette due to technical limitations. Because of this, Nintendo took the colors from the Koopa enemy and recolored Mario to make Luigi. His iconic green outfit was born from a technical limitation, but that hasn't stopped Luigi from appearing in countless games since. Check Me Out channel. The Check Me Out channel was also known as the Mii Contest channel in Europe and Japan. This was a channel on the Nintendo Wii that allowed players to share their Miis and enter them into popularity contests. Players could then rank other Miis and even take pictures with them. The Check Me Out channel was one of the most popular Wii channels until it was discontinued in 2013. We Would Like to Play. We Would Like to Play was an advertising campaign showing two Japanese businessmen with a Wiimote stating, we would like to play. These commercials were directed by Steven Goggin, who's an Academy Award winning director. Despite being slightly off-putting, these commercials were a massive success and no doubt sold countless Wii units.
Joy-Con Drift. The Joy-Con controllers for the Nintendo Switch system have a serious defect. Their analog sticks frequently drift or detect false inputs in one direction, even when not being touched. This can result in your camera slightly moving one direction, a character slowly walking into the distance, or miss inputs in a game such as Super Smash Bros. Nintendo has experienced multiple lawsuits because of this defect and offers a free repair program where you can send in your controllers to be fixed, but there are multiple reports of quote unquote fixed controllers, regaining Joy-Con Drift later on. Super Mario Bros. Movie Casting In January of 2018, Nintendo announced that a Super Mario Bros. movie from Illumination Entertainment was under development. However, it took almost four years for us to finally learn who would be voicing these iconic characters. What followed was absolute madness, as on September 23rd, 2021, during a Nintendo Direct, the internet lost their collective minds as we learned about Chris Pratt, Anya Taylor-Joy, Charlie Day, Seth Rogen, Jack Black, and all the hilarity that would ensue from such a bizarre, out of left field voice cast. Wiimotes crashing into TV. You know that little wrist strap at the bottom of the Wii remote? That is made so that this doesn't happen. When the Wii came out, it was a massive success and a lot of people who had never touched video games before were picking up these consoles. Because of that, a lot of people seemingly didn't understand that you had to hold on to the controller as you were swinging it around playing Wii Sports. This resulted in thousands of TVs getting smashed through as Wii remotes were sent hurling at them at high velocity. There are countless Wii remote crashing into TV compilations on YouTube, and in March of 2008, Panasonic even made a reinforced range of LCD TVs with tougher glass to protect against airborne Nintendo Wiimotes flying off into the TVs. Pokemon Cards Pokemon cards have experienced a massive resurgence in collecting sale price and value thanks to many factors. Public figures such as Logan Paul have been pointed out as reasons driving up the price of these collectible pieces of paper. The most expensive of these cards being a PSA 10 Pikachu Illustrator supposedly paid for by Logan Paul at a valuation of $5.275 million. Calculator. Gunpei Yokoi started his tenure at Nintendo not as a game designer, but as an electrician. When president of Nintendo Hiroshi Yamauchi noticed that Yokoi had made an extendable arm toy in his spare time at work, he was ordered to make it into a proper product, which would go on to be one of Nintendo's most successful toys at the time the Ultra Hand. This success slingshotted Yukoi to become one of the most influential minds at Nintendo, working on big projects like the original Donkey Kong, Mario Bros, and Metroid. But what he's probably most well known for is the Game Boy. It is said he came up with the idea for the Game Boy while on a train where he saw a tired businessman playing on his calculator. Tug of War The N64 is known for many things. The birth of 3D gaming, the rise of multiplayer party games like Super Smash Bros. and Mario Kart. But if there's one thing it's most famous for, it's for this three-handed controller. See, not only was the N64 the first controller made for aliens, but it was also the first Nintendo controller to introduce a control stick. Because of its novelty, many players found creative ways to spin the control stick in the Mario Party minigame Tug of War. The goal of the game was to spin your stick in a circle as fast as you could to beat your opponent. However, players figured out that spinning it with the the palm of your hand rather than your thumb was actually faster. This led to many blisters and injuries. Nintendo was actually sued by over 90 families and was issued to pay over $80 million worth of protective gloves to players. Mew Truck Mew Under the Truck was a classic schoolyard rumor that the mythical Pokemon Mew could actually be obtained under a truck near the SS Anne. This rumor probably spawned by just how cumbersome and stupid this patch of grass is that holds this truck. Like, why is it even coded into the game? It must have some significance. To get there, you have to have a Pokemon that knows Surf. But wait, you don't learn Surf until after you board the SS Anne. How are you supposed to Surf around the SS Anne when you're only able to enter the SS Anne once? That's why this rumor became so juicy. It was an area just out of reach, with a logical solution and reward. But alas, after going through all of the trouble of trading in a Pokemon with Surf earlier into the game, or whiting out inside the SSN after you got Surf, nothing waits for you on Truck Island except, well, the truck. New Funky Mode Since the dawn of the Switch, many of its new games have been ports from the Wii U. However, Nintendo will usually add some form of additional content in order to get users to buy games that they might have already owned on another console. Mario Kart 8 Deluxe got Battle Mode, 3D World got Bowser's Fury, 
but when it came time for Donkey Kong Tropical Freeze to get the same treatment, it got new Funky Mode, which really just means you could play as Funky Kong. It's kind of funny how Nintendo tried to market this as some massive new feature, considering that how obscure the phrase new Funky Mode is, with fans taking the new Funky Mode banner from the game's box art and adding it to random box arts of other games where it made absolutely no sense whatsoever. Overall, it's just a funny phrase and also a way that fans could just poke fun at Nintendo for their oversaturation saturation of ports at the time. Nintendo Ninjas Forever, Nintendo's legal team has been known to be one of the most ruthless in the gaming industry, DMCAing and cease and desisting any fan project and emulator website off the face of the earth. Forever, their nickname has been the Nintendo Ninjas, as one sec you'll hear from a mod developer or a leaker, and the next you'll never hear from them again. Their stealth and swiftness has been turned into somewhat of an urban legend among the Nintendo community, and has given them this reputation. Hanafuda and Toys Did you know that Nintendo Nintendo was actually created in 1889? That means they've been around since before the radio, plastic, and yes, sliced bread. But what exactly did they make before video games? Well, they jumped around between many products. At first, they made Hanafuda cards, a type of playing card that was allowed in Japan after gambling was banned in 1882. They also created many toys, including the Ultra Hand, the Ultra Machine, and the 10 Billion Barrel. While they were able to survive a surprisingly long time, it wasn't until they started making arcade games in the 1970s that their brand really started to take off. But it sure is interesting to know how Nintendo got to where they are today. Fat Pikachu. Okay, Pikachu is still cute today, but come on, look how chubby he used to be. Atsuko Nishida, the creator of Pikachu, said that when she was creating Pikachu, her inspiration was to create a mouse-like creature with no distinction between its head and its body, almost dumpling-shaped. And you can't tell me this Pikachu is dumpling-shaped. It's said that Pikachu was changed to be skinnier to make him easier to animate in the anime, but I can't help but feel that's just a cop-out. And honestly, I think the animators were just jealous of how cute he was. But this story does have a happy ending, because in Pokemon Sword and Shield, Pikachu's gigantic Max form looks awfully similar to the fat Pikachu of years past, so at least he's not forgotten. Super Mario Bros. 2 In 1986, Nintendo developed the sequel to Super Mario Bros. aptly named Super Mario Bros. 2. However, when the game was shown off to Nintendo of America, they believed the game was too hard for their player base. So Nintendo decided to adapt a Japanese exclusive game called Doki Doki Panic and reskin it with Mario characters, and its name was Super Mario Bros. 2. This game is very different from any other Mario game, as for one, jumping on enemies doesn't kill them, and two, many of the enemies are one-offs you'll never see again, as they're Doki Doki Panic characters. However, mainstays like Birdo and Shy Guy actually made their first appearance in this game. Eventually, North American audiences would get the original Super Mario Bros. 2 as the Lost Levels in Super Mario Bros. All-Stars, and Japanese players would get the American Super Mario Bros. 2 as Super Mario Bros. USA, Virtual Boy. The Virtual Boy wasn't just a failure, it is THE failure. It's the only Nintendo console not to break a million sales. For many of you, you might not even remember that this thing exists, because so little people owned one, and so few games were ever made for it, that it's honestly easier just pretending like it doesn't. It's awkward tabletop headset, headache-inducing red graphics, controller with two D-pads for particularly no reason, this just shows how sad this console truly was. Nintendo would eventually go back to 3D tech in the form of the 3DS and Labo VR, but none would be as humiliating as Nintendo's Virtual Boy. Nintendo Switch has games. Shocking, right? Part of the promotion for the Nintendo Switch at the Game Awards in 2019 included a trailer with the tagline, Nintendo Switch has games. The stupidity of such a tagline for a company that makes one product that does one thing was enough to set the world ablaze with memes making a mockery of this trailer and going absolutely bananas reacting to the fact that the Switch has games. Totaka's Song Koizumi Totaka is a composer who's worked on songs for many Nintendo games throughout the years, starting with games like Mario Paint. In many of his games, you can find a sample melody that has become to be known Totaka's Song. The song is often hidden in his games as sort of an easter egg. By clicking on the O in the title screen of Mario Paint, you'll see an explosion, followed by a famous 19-note melody. Some of the ways the song has appeared in games can be pretty creative. For instance, in Mario Kart 8, the Yoshis in Yoshi Valley can be heard humming the tune if you drive close enough to them.
Overall, if you're playing a Nintendo game and you see Totaka's name listed in the credits, there's a good chance this song will make an appearance. You just have to look in the right place. Super Game Boy The Super Game Boy was advice that allowed you to play Game Boy games on your TV through your Super Nintendo. It let you change the color palette of the games as well as the borders around the game. This device was also pretty cool because you could play Game Boy games without actually ever owning a Game Boy. In addition to the Super Game Boy, a sequel called Super Game Boy 2 released exclusively in Japan, which had quicker loading times and this sick translucent casing. There was also a Game Boy player for the GameCube that allowed players to play GBA games on their GameCube. Melee Super Smash Bros. Melee came out in 2001, but despite this, it is still one of the most alive and thriving communities in gaming. Its quick movement and complicated mechanics are a result of the extremely short 13-month development cycle, which left the game with many quirks not found in any other edition of Smash. This makes it one of the most unique games in the series, as while some would see these oversights as flaws, the competitive scene sees them as necessities. While Sakurai and the team always saw Smash as first and foremost a party game, Melee shines through, no pun intended, with its community-backed tournaments and grassroot flair. Actually, that pun was totally intended. Not to mention all the crazy clips it's given us through the years. Meverse. Meverse was Nintendo's version of a social media platform. It was active from 2012 to 2017 and was used on both the Wii U and 3DS. Meverse stood out with its unique hand-drawn posting features. It worked with many games in interesting ways, such as Super Mario 3D World with its stamps, Mario Maker's hint posts, and Super Smash Bros. for the Wii U's Meverse stage. Moderation wasn't the best, but it was still a good time and made that generation of Nintendo consoles feel very community-driven and inviting. While Meverse wasn't brought to the Switch, many games like Mario Maker 2 and Splatoon 2 and 3 have features reminiscent of this old platform, which is nice to see. Nintendo World Championships In 1990, Nintendo held a video game championship circuit touring around North America as a way to celebrate Nintendo's 100th anniversary. In the event, competitors competed on a special NES cartridge in a series of mini games based on Super Mario Bros., Rad Racer, and Tetris. While many of those cartridges were the normal gray color, 26 of them were made using the Legend of Zelda gold casing. Both the gray gray and gold cartridges have been known to go for exorbitant amounts of money and are some of the rarest Nintendo games in existence. Nintendo brought the championships back two more times, once in 2015 to commemorate its 25th anniversary and once more in 2017. March 31st, 2021 Super Mario 3D All-Stars was announced during the Super Mario 35th Anniversary Direct and went on to be released on September 18th, 2020. Alongside this announcement, it was revealed that the game would have a limited release and stop being sold on March 31st, 2021. Why? Well, it's rumored that this was a marketing tactic to create artificial scarcity, and it worked. I know so many people who bought the game both digitally and physically in fear of not being able to own the game in the future. I guess it's reasonable to attribute this limited run to the timely release during the anniversary, but in my opinion, this move was more shady and extremely anti-consumer. But you know, at least you can still play the game unlike Super Mario Bros. 35. That game literally is unplayable now. Mother 3 Mother 3, as you can expect, is the third entry in the Mother series. However, it was never actually released outside of Japan. See, the Mother series has always had a bit of a weird relationship with international releases. The original Mother never made it to the NES, and was only ever localized in 2015 under the moniker Earthbound Beginnings on the Wii U Virtual Console. Mother 2 2 was ported to the SNES as Earthbound. And then there's Mother 3. Mother 3 was a GBA title and was just never localized for an international audience. There's no real reason or rhyme to this, but Nintendo just doesn't seem to want to give it to us. It's become somewhat of a meme among Nintendo fans with even Nintendo poking fun at it in their 2014 E3 presentation. Come on, Reggie, give us Mother 3. How about this instead? <laughs> Nintendo's refusal to give fans what they want is nothing new, and Mother 3 is the epitome of this frustration. However, an official English fan translation is available online if you know where to look. Flappy Bird Pipes Flappy Bird might be one of the most legendary and mysterious games of the modern era. Whether it be the discussions on why the creator took it off the App Store, phones who still had the game going for an insane amount of money on eBay, or how such a rage-inducing game took a chokehold on iPhone users in 2013. However, part of its mystique was its correlation with Mario. 
It doesn't take a rocket scientist to tell that these pipes look identical to the ones found in Mario games. A popular video on YouTube supposedly showing what happens at the end of the game included Piranha Plants and Mario himself. While it turned out to be a hoax, the pipes itself surely added to the game's mythos and led to many theories that have made this game the legend it is. N64DD At the time, the N64 was starting to make the Nintendo brand dated. The Sony's PlayStation with its disc-based games were starting to take the lead in the industry. Nintendo's solution was the N64DD. The N64DD was a disc drive peripheral for the N64 that allowed players to enhance their gaming experience. It was the first Nintendo device that could connect to the internet and allowed for rewritable storage on disc of games. However, development for the announced games slowly either got cancelled or pushed to cartridges. The N64DD was also quietly released with little promotion in Japan and was soon forgotten about. Only 10 games were ever made for it, and just about 15,000 units were ever sold, making it one of the biggest commercial failures in Nintendo's history. Skyward Sword E3 Demo At E3 2011, while showcasing Skyward Sword's motion controls, Murphy's Law took effect, as the entire segment was a disaster. The motion controls simply didn't work, leaving Miyamoto flailing his arms around with the Wiimote and Nunchuck, as Link failed to take in his inputs. In retrospect, whether they were standing too far away from the motion Bar or something else, clearly something was wrong with the setup itself. After all, while Skyward Sword wasn't perfect with its motion controls, it wasn't nearly that unreceptive. That doesn't change the fact that this blooper continued for six minutes, making it one of the most infamous, awkward moments in E3 history, and also led people to believe that this was the reason that Nintendo moved away from live presentations. Siva Gunner. In 2008, a YouTube channel, Silva Gunner, started posting songs from video games to their channel so that others could listen to them. And sadly, this channel ended up being terminated due to copyright. To pay homage to the original channel, another channel called Gilva Sunner was created, and it continued to upload video game music. But then, yet another channel popped up called Giva Sunner. The second I in the name was capitalized, as the channel is supposed to give the illusion that it is actually Gilva Sunner. Instead of legitimate songs from video games, the channel uploaded parodies of the songs by combining them with memes and pop culture references in order to create what they refer to as high quality rips. For instance, if you wanted to listen to the athletic theme from Super Mario World, you'd expect to hear this. But instead, you would be listening to something like this. This channel also ended up being terminated because it was deemed misleading. However, another channel was later created with the same premise called Siva Gunner, and we've come full circle. The Siva Gunner channel is still incredibly active today, and while the songs can be easily brushed off as memes, many of them are actually pretty good rips and are definitely worth a listen. Super Mario 128 Super Mario 128 was a tech demo shown off during the Space World event in 2000, in anticipation of the upcoming release of Nintendo's next console, the GameCube. The demo showcased the GameCube's power through how up to 128 Marios could be displayed on screen as they interacted with a large, constantly changing landscape. The game ultimately never released as it was merely a tech demo, but elements from the game made their way into future titles such as Pikmin and Super Mario Galaxy. Today, people will jokingly reference the game as though it's an upcoming sequel to Super Mario 64 due to its namesake, but the game is realistically never making an official release. Missing No In the 1998 North American and European versions of Pokemon Red and Blue, a glitched Pokemon was discovered called Missing No. Missing No could be encountered by doing a series of convoluted tasks that would trick the game into triggering an encounter with a Pokemon with an invalid identifier, therefore encountering Missing No. Missing No could be captured and even had a hybrid bird slash normal typing, which is weird because bird types don't exist. While the thought alone of a mysterious glitched Pokemon is cool in and of itself, it was also used to cause a duplication glitch in which the sixth item in in your inventory would increase all the way up to 128. It was discovered in the May 1999 Nintendo Power magazine, and has since become one of, if not the most fascinating glitches in gaming history. Nintendo fat shamed people on Wii Fit. During the Wii era, some of Nintendo's games were certainly unconventional, and Wii Fit was no exception. It was an early attempt at combining both gaming and fitness, and because of that, some of the decisions behind the game may seem questionable looking back. One of the game's features allowed users to weigh themselves, and based on the user's height and weight, it would display their BMI. Depending on their BMI range, the game would play a different jingle. The default jingle sounded like this.
and the pitch would become higher or lower if the user was underweight or overweight. The obese jingle, labeled verifat.mp4 in the game's files, sounded like this. Having this on play paired with the user's me turning into the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man? Yeah, it's pretty funny in retrospect. To be fair, the game is centered around fitness, and I don't think Nintendo's genuine intent was to shame users. Rather, the goal was simply to translate a fitness routine into a game, using sound effects as you would expect to see in any other game. The fact that Nintendo's President of America willingly demoed this portion of the game in front of an audience kind of exemplifies this. Backwards Long Jump Super Mario 64 has one of the most iconic and most broken X exploits in any video game. Because the game has no backwards speed limit when performing a long jump, players can break the game through spamming backwards long jumps, allowing them to glitch through walls and reach areas that they aren't supposed to. Using this exploit, speedrunners have been able to beat the game way faster than intended, with some runs collecting zero stars. Nintendo is definitely aware of this glitch, because they cut it from a Japanese re-release of the game in 1997. And this is the version that was used in Super Mario 3D All-Stars, so sadly, the game isn't much use to speedrunners. Satoru Iwata Bananas During Nintendo's E3 showcase in 2012, Iwata made a cameo in a pre-recorded clip where he is mysteriously holding a bunch of bananas. The oddest thing about this is that nobody really knows why he did this, as it wasn't really relevant to anything Nintendo announced during the event. Some people speculate that he was hinting at Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze, but that game wasn't even revealed until the next year. Ultimately, it's just bizarre and something we'll probably never fully understand understand. Game Boy Video In 2004, the Game Boy Advance video series launched, and it was a line of Game Boy cartridges that allowed you to watch films or episodes of TV shows on your GBA. The only movies that ever released for the platform were Shrek, Shrek 2, and Shark Tale, which is definitely a small selection. As for the shows, they were essentially just demos of TV series for kids, like Pokemon or The Fairly Odd Parents. A cartridge would typically contain only a few episodes of a show and would retail for $20, which seems seems pretty steep looking back. It really feels like these were just a way to introduce these shows to kids, as you wouldn't realistically own an entire season of a show on these cartridges. However, just about every kid that had a GPA owned at least one of these, whether it was Spongebob or Kim Possible or whatever, it was sort of a novelty to have a portable version of something you could only watch on the TV usually, so I understand the appeal for the time being. Super Mario Bros. Super Show The Super Mario Bros. Super Show was an animated series that ran in 1989 and was produced by Deke Enterprises. It's based off Super Mario Bros. and Super Mario Bros. 2, taking elements and characters from both. Probably the strangest thing about this show was the live-action segments that would play before and after each episode featuring the real Mario and Luigi. The most iconic thing to come from this show is definitely its intro theme song, which plays to the tune of a remix version of World 1-1. The song was actually used in the Super Mario Bros. movie, in the segment where the plumbers produced their ad campaign for TV. Deke Entertainment went on to also produce two more Mario series, including The Adventures of Super Mario Mario Bros. 3 and Super Mario World, which came out the same years that those games launched in the West. Funnily enough, the Super Mario Bros. 3 series began production before the Koopalings even had names, so they took matters into their own hands and just made up names for the characters. For instance, Wendy O. Koopa is referred to as Cootie Pie in the series. I remember seeing old episodes from these shows as a kid and being really confused because of that, but then again, I also didn't understand why Peach was Princess Toadstool and Bowser was King Koopa either. Honestly, it's a bit wild that these shows were even produced in the first place, but considering they're clearly made for kids, they're not too bad and could have been a lot worse. Satellaview Exclusive to the Super Famicom in Japan, the Satellaview was an add-on that would let players download software using satellite broadcast. It's basically Nintendo's first eShop, but many people have never even heard of it since it was never released in the West and was also fairly expensive, retailing for more than the SNES itself. Many of the games offered through this service were exclusives, including a 16-bit version of the original Legend of Zelda titled BS Zelda no Densetsu. The service was ultimately discontinued in 2000, and because of this, several of the Satellaview games have been lost to time and may never be playable again. Year of Luigi Since its launch, the Wii U was a massive failure and had continued to underperform. So in 2013, Nintendo came up with a campaign that would fix all of their problems, the Year of Luigi. Nintendo decided to honor the 30th anniversary of Luigi's first appearance in the Mario Bros. arcade game. Thus, the Luigi games began to pour in. Luigi U, Luigi Mansion, Dr. Luigi, Mario Luigi. It truly was the Year of Luigi. It also was a year where Nintendo lost $457 million, and because of that, we're probably never getting a 
year of Luigi again. Now, was Luigi actually the culprit? Was his year genuinely the cause of the half a billion dollar loss? I mean, it probably didn't help, but realistically, it was simply due to the Wii U and its horrible marketing. However, the idea that Luigi caused all of Nintendo's financial troubles that year has continued to spread throughout the internet, mostly as a running joke. CDI games. Nintendo had once intended to make a CD-ROM add-on for the SNES, and they originally planned to partner with Sony and ended up deciding to partner with Philips instead. After Sega ended up releasing a similar product that failed miserably, Nintendo went it out. In order to break their agreement with Philips, Nintendo allowed them to create their own licensed Nintendo games using their characters. So on their own console, the Philips CDI, they ended up making games like Hotel Mario and the Zelda Trilogy. Were these games any good? No, they're renowned for being absolutely terrible. Nintendo probably didn't regret pulling out of the agreement because of this. When it comes to Sony though, they decided to make their own console in response, the PlayStation, which ended up being pretty devastating to Nintendo in the long run. The L on Luigi's hat is backwards. This is the box art to Mario Kart Double Dash for the Nintendo GameCube, and if you have a keen eye, you may notice that Nintendo made a bit of an oopsie. The L on Luigi's hat is backwards. Some people speculate that this is some sort of obscure reference to Mirror Mode, but realistically, somebody flipped this render when making the box art to make it fit better and didn't notice the error. I mean, the L is barely even visible with Luigi tilting his head so far to the right. This is one of those Nintendo facts that most people are unfamiliar with, but for those in the Nintendo community, it's become a randomly commonly known fact. Just the phrase the L on Luigi's hat is backwards is basically an if you know you know type of thing. Minus World. There are many glitches in the original Super Mario Bros, but one of the most infamous is Minus World. Minus World is a glitch level that is identical to World 7 2. But it is impossible to beat as the warp pipe at the end of the level takes you back to the beginning rather than the flagpole. It's called Minus World because it is written out as blank dash 1, but in reality it's actually 36 dash 1. Since the game can't display the number 36, it just leaves it blank, giving the name of the level Minus 1. The reason this happens is because when you enter the warp pipe to the Minus World, the game is actually loading the warp zone from 4 dash 2, in which there is only one pipe that led you to World 5. Since there is only one pipe in that warp zone, the pipes on the left and right lead you to the Minus World. In reality, there are many glitchy Minus World levels in the game, but because of how accessible this level is, it became the legend it is today. Pika Blue In the late 90s, Pokemon Red and Blue were the talk of the town. Yet, if you were a kid who had successfully caught all 151 Kanto Pokemon, you probably were left wanting more. Before the release of Pokemon Gold and Silver though, fans got a taste of what new Pokemon could look like, as promotional material slowly continued to drizzle out. In the 1998 short Pikachu's Vacation, a few brand new Pokemon were featured, including Meryl, who was not given a name at the time. Fans could only speculate what this new Pokemon could be, and because of its mouse-like features, many believed that it was related to Pikachu, whether it was a new evolution or something else. Thus, it was given the nickname Pika Blue, basically a blue version of Pikachu. In the end, it turned out to just be Meryl, its own water-type Pokemon. However, it really just goes to show what a different era it was back then. Because the internet was still in its early days, speculation could run rampant, as information was not always so readily available at the time. Fat DS. Okay, I want you to do something really quick. Close your eyes and picture the Nintendo DS. Alright, now did it look like this, or something more like this? The Fat DS is the nickname for the first DS that Nintendo ever released. However, it's weirdly become one of the most forgettable models, despite being the default version of the DS. Something about the way the system looks, it's just clunky and a bit overwhelming. When the DS Lite came out, it was smoother, sleeker, and just more aesthetically pleasing overall. And after it was released, it was almost as if nobody used the original DS anymore. Despite playing the same games, it felt like if you ever just saw someone playing the DS in public, it was almost always a DS Lite or DSi. Maybe fat DS users were shamed out of existence, but I'm interested in hearing what you guys think about this. Also, comment down below if you thought of the original DS or a later variant in my little experiment earlier. Wii Sports Club Wii Sports Club is easily the most forgettable game in the Nintendo Sports series. Nintendo had originally shown off elements of the game all the way back in 2011 when they showed off the Wii U at E3. It demonstrated how the Wiimote could interact with the game pad to make the gameplay feel more immersive. However, the game didn't release until almost a year after the Wii U did. The strangest thing about this game is how Nintendo released it. They made each individual sports title available on the eShop and released them months apart. Nintendo took one of the things that made the Wii so popular, a game that perfectly showcased the features of the console that was also included with it, and turned it into something that was tedious to even purchase. It's just yet another weird marketing decision that makes it easy to understand why the Wii U flopped as hard as it did. The Wizard. The Wizard 
Wired is a film that released in 1989 which follows the life of a kid who enters a large video game tournament. It's best known for its partnership with Nintendo, which led to the film featuring references to Nintendo products such as the NES Power Glove. At the tournament, the big game that the kids compete in ends up being Super Mario Bros. 3. Not only was this game not even released at the time, but this was the first time the West was even exposed to it. The movie was largely written off as a cash grab, basically just another way to promote Nintendo's games. But nowadays, the inclusion of Nintendo games is just about all the film is known for. Amiibo shortages. As Toys to Life was becoming a popular feature in gaming, Nintendo took their own swing at the idea by introducing Amiibo. The cool thing about Amiibo is that one toy would have functionality across several different games, making them more valuable. However, the toy's value mainly came from collectors, who proudly displayed their collection of toys on their shelves, never actually using them in the games. Because of this, Nintendo underestimated the demand for Amiibo at launch, and figures like Wii Fit Trainer and Marth were almost impossible to find from the start, as these are characters that you wouldn't typically expect to get their own figurines. I got to experience the amiibo craze firsthand. As a kid, I had my dad take me to the store to pick up Splatoon at launch, and on that very same day, a new wave of amiibo was also releasing. So, we were met with several men eagerly awaiting to purchase the new line of toys. Within minutes, almost all the amiibo were gone. There's many theories that Nintendo intentionally understocked amiibo in order to drive up hype around them. To be fair, I think that Nintendo probably didn't anticipate that there would be a high demand for characters like Robin or Shulk, but I understand why people believe this, especially because Nintendo started to release store-exclusive amiibo like the infamous Golden Mario. Muppet E3 Since 2013, all of Nintendo's E3 presentations have been hosted via Nintendo Directs instead of a traditional format. In the early years, Nintendo's E3 Directs were certainly creative. In 2015, Nintendo had the Jim Henson Company, the organization behind the Muppets, make puppet versions of some of their representatives including Reggie, Miyamoto, and Iwata. It was just an centric inclusion to make Nintendo's presentation stand out from the rest, and it was also used as a bit to promote the upcoming Star Fox Zero, as the puppets later begin to turn into characters from the Star Fox series. Many people speculate that this was also used as a way to allow Iwata to be part of the Direct, as he was ill at the time and passed away just a month later. These segments definitely spiced up the presentation, and you can tell they had a lot of fun with them. There's a scene where the group spots a superstar and abruptly begins to dance, and there's another one that just features the puppet version of Iwata holding a bunch of bananas and staring into the camera, a niche reference to E3 2011. Triforce shirt with cargo shorts. For whatever reason, the green Triforce shirt paired with cargo shorts has become known as the outfit of gamers. My theory is that the Triforce logo is subtle enough that it's a way for gamers to communicate something along the lines of, I am a gamer, are you? As for the cargo shorts, the large overbearing pockets are how Zelda fans connect to their favorite hero. Just as Link, they too can carry an ungodly, nonsensical amount of items in their pockets. For real though, the outfit has become a popular reference among fans, with one Twitter user tweeting, Breath of the Wild 2 should have a pre-order bonus in the form of a unique armor set, and it's just Link wearing this, followed by a picture of the iconic outfit. Nintendo Switch Parental Controls on January 13th of 2017, a trailer was uploaded to Nintendo's YouTube channel showing off the features for Nintendo Switch parental controls. Despite the relatively boring subject matter, the trailer became an instant meme thanks to its vibrant animations of Bowser Jr. And while the original upload has almost 50 million views on YouTube, there are countless examples of the video being remixed or memed into YTPs or YouTube poops that have also masked countless views. Mario's Early Years Mario's Early Years is a trilogy series of point-and-click adventure games that were released on the MS-DOS and the SNES. These games were developed by Software Toolworks and they're some of the rare Mario games that were not developed by Nintendo. The three games consist of Mario's Early Years Fun with Letters, Mario's Early Years Fun with Numbers, and Mario's Early Years Preschool Fun. The Super Nintendo versions of these games supported the SNES mouse peripheral. Wii Vitality Sensor The Wii Vitality Sensor was a cancelled peripheral for the Wii that would plug into your Wiimote where the nunchuck goes and measure your heart rate. Yeah, this thing was pretty weird. Revealed at E3 2009 by Satoru Iwata, there was never any software shown off that would utilize the device. Iwata claimed they'd show off games for the accessory at E3 2010, but that fell through and the device was confirmed to be cancelled in 2013. Obviously, certain games like Wii Fit would have used this, but would they have been able to shove a Vitality sensor into any other type of game? Comment down below any ideas if you have, maybe like a Mario Party minigame or something, I don't know. 
Nintendo PlayStation. Now known as arguably Nintendo's biggest rival, Sony's PlayStation was originally the Nintendo PlayStation. It was a prototype hybrid console that could play both SNES games and Sony's new CD-based Super Disc format. Apparently in June 1991, Sony went to CES to announce their partnership with Nintendo, but then when Nintendo had their press conference the next day and were asked about the Super Disc add-on, they said it was being developed by Philips, not Sony. That's because Sony wanted to control licensing for CD versions of the games, which Nintendo didn't like at all. After this dispute, Sony decided to take the technology and just make their own console, the PlayStation. As we mentioned before in the section about the Philips CDI, that's what Nintendo's partnership with Philips ended up turning into. However, one Nintendo PlayStation does exist and was auctioned off in 2020 for $300,000. Kirby hates America. Look at the Japanese box art for Kirby's Air Ride. Now look at the American box art. Notice any differences? Now look at the Japanese box art for Kirby's Return to Dreamland, and now look at the American. Kirby is almost always happy in Japanese box art, but turned to be angry in American. Kirby's Squeak Squad is literally the exact same art, it only changes the eyebrows. Now this can be chalked up to one of two reasons. Either it's a bizarre marketing decision, based on some potentially true belief that American consumers are more likely to buy video games with angry protagonists, or Kirby just hates America. Universal City Studios Incorporated versus Nintendo Co. Limited. Despite Universal and Nintendo later partnering up to make the 2023 Super Mario Bros. movie, in 1983 Universal sued Nintendo, alleging that Donkey Kong was a trademark infringement of King Kong. Funnily enough, eight years earlier, Universal was getting countersued by RKO General over who had the rights to King Kong, but Universal argued that it was public domain and they won. So then when Universal sued Nintendo, Nintendo just argued that Universal had already proven that King Kong was public domain and Nintendo won. Despite the odd fact that Nintendo used their own prosecutor as precedent, this was actually huge. If Nintendo had lost this, they would have been screwed over, as Donkey Kong was by far their biggest success story. Not only did this case save Nintendo as a company, but it established them as a major player in the entertainment industry, and arguably gave the company confidence that it could compete against the giants of American media. Leave luck to heaven. The phrase Nintendo is thought to translate to leave luck to heaven, but there's been some disputing if that's actually true considering how kanji characters can often have different interpretations. The book The History of Nintendo points out that Hiroshi Yamauchi, the great grandson of the company's founder, admitted that not even he knew what the true meaning of the company's name was. Super Mario's Wacky World. Super Mario World is one of the most popular Mario games ever, and it almost had a direct sequel that wasn't Yoshi's Island. Super Mario's Wacky Worlds was a canceled platformer for the CDI. Unlike the games we think of when we think of the CDI, this one actually could have been pretty good. The prototype was loved by Nintendo, and the developer Nova Logic was hoping to be acquired as a second party developer after this game. Because of that, Nova Logic was supposedly making this as a traditional 2D Mario platformer. So if the Philips CDI had sold better, and this game wasn't cancelled, 2D Mario platforming could have been changed forever. Slippy. Project Slippy is a melee community project that gives the games many features that help competitive play, such as rollback netcode, automatically saved replays, and integrated matchmaking. Naturally, this makes the game far better for competitive players, and Slippy has widely been adopted by the comp melee scene. However, Nintendo has obviously been against melee, and is also against any type of modding. These two hatreds of Nintendo's combined in 2020 when they cancelled the Big House 10, which was a tournament set to use Slippy given that it it was peak pandemic and it was unfeasible to get all the players together in person. Using Slippy would have allowed for the tournament to happen and for it to be way safer, but Nintendo shut it down and lost even more of the Melee community's respect, if they had any left to lose. Beef with PETA. PETA has beefed with Nintendo a ton, making games such as New Super Chick Sisters, a spoof on New Super Mario Bros, Mario Kills Tanuki, an incredibly gruesome title, in which Mario skins actual Tanukis to wear their suit for fur, and Pokemon Black and Blue, Gotta Free Em All, where players free Pokemon from quote, human enslavement. These are absolutely ridiculous, and Nintendo has struck down many other fan games, but has never filed for any sort of action against PETA. Joe Keery in Cringe Amiibo Ad Joe Keery is an actor most famous for playing Steve Harrington in the hit Netflix show Stranger Things. On October 23rd, 2014, Nintendo dropped this extremely cringeworthy commercial, which in my opinion epitomized everything that was wrong with the Wii U's marketing. Keery plays, I think, a friend of the older brother of the protagonist. While the entire commercial is very cringeworthy, Keery's character has a Donkey Kong Amiibo, which instantly makes him my favorite. 
creative fellow. Creator of Mario, Shigeru Miyamoto left software development in 2015, meaning he doesn't work on the games themselves anymore. His current title is, quote, creative fellow for Nintendo. Funnily enough, Junichi Masuda is also a chief creative fellow at the Pokemon Company. This is a very unorthodox title, which does not have any exact definition, but can be assumed to be more of an advisory role given to certain prestigious senior employees at Japanese companies. Sonic in Melee. Sonic and Tails being in Melee was an April Fool's Day prank from 2002 pulled by EGM Magazine. In this issue, they included a short article with a convincing for the time Photoshop claiming that Sega's Sonic and Tails characters from the Sonic the Hedgehog franchise could be unlocked as secret playable fighters in Melee. According to this article, players would have had to defeat 20 enemies in the game's cruel Melee mode. And funny enough, this hoax was believed by so many that Nintendo added a frequently asked question to their website promoting Super Smash Bros. Melee, specifically deconfirming Sonic's inclusion months after this article came out. Gulf War Game Boy. They just don't make them like they used to. This Game Boy suffered massive damage in 1991 during the Gulf War. There are conflicting reports on whether or not it survived a bombing or a raging barracks fire, but the fact that it can still run its copy of Tetris is a marvel. This piece of history used to be displayed in the Nintendo New York flagship store, but is now apparently in the Nintendo of America headquarters in Redmond, Washington. GameCube Handle. What is the GameCube's greatest innovation? Is it the perfectly ergonomic controller, or the unique for the time analog triggers, or this small piece of plastic? That's right, every GameCube had a handle, which I guess does technically make the console more portable, and during Nintendo's 2017 Nintendo Switch presentation, Nintendo specifically shouted out this piece of plastic as inspiration for the Nintendo Switch. Mario and LeBron James. NBA Street V3 had Mario, Luigi, and Peach as playable characters under the Nintendo All-Stars moniker. Not only does that mean that Mario can dunk on LeBron James, Vince Carter, and other 2005 NBA stars, but also NBA legends such as Magic Johnson, Larry Bird, and Wilt Chamberlain. Also, you could apparently unlock the Beastie Boys as playable characters in this game randomly, so yeah, Mario could dunk on the Beastie Boys as well. Iwata Mi Update In June of 2014, Satoru Iwata had surgery to remove a tumor in his bile duct. This surgery caused him to lose a fair amount of weight, and he responded by updating his official Mi. Quote, Because of the operation I underwent in June last year, I've become a little thin. I've decided to update my official Mi to reflect my present condition. Pikmin Shorts. The Pikmin Shorts are a trio of short movies released in 2014. These CGI shorts feature Pikmin, Olimar, and were created by Dynamo Pictures with Shigeru Miyamoto producing. Funnily enough, four bonus clips were also produced and sold for $5 on the Wii U and 3DS eShops, but of course they just ended up being posted onto YouTube for free viewing. Hello Little Stylus. When the Nintendo 3DS launched, Nintendo decided to get original Mario voice actor Charles Martinet to commentate a 3DS hardware tour. This results in some hilarious voice lines as Mario is explaining how to use the Nintendo 3DS system, with the funniest and most memed of these voice lines being when Mario talks about the Nintendo 3DS stylus. But Nintendo 3DS comes with an extending stylus. Hello Little Stylus. Double Yoshi Exploshi. It's no secret that Nintendo's marketing during the Wii U era was very odd. They were trying so hard to be cool, but it just ended off coming off as the how do you do fellow kids meme and ended up not only alienating their older customers, but also many teenagers and kids. One of the peak examples of just odd Nintendo marketing that's kind of cringy and funny to look back on is this Yoshi's Woolly World ad. Tapping a yarn Yoshi amiibo. <laughs> Woshi! It's a double Yoshi Exploshi! I don't know what prompted Nintendo to think Woshi, it's a double Yoshi Exploshi was a good tagline for their product, but we live in this world now, there's nothing we can do but move forward. Sora 1. On April 1st, 2015, Nintendo announced the Super Smash Bros. character ballot, in which fans could vote in their favorite game characters to join the Smash roster. However, in June 2018, a data leak revealed that the winner had already been chosen as early as April 15th just 14 days after it was first announced. The winner was announced to be Bayonetta during the final Smash 4 Direct, but this turned out to be false, as Sora was actually revealed to be the winner by Sakurai in the final Smash Ultimate Direct. However, Iwata thought it would be best to hide the true results as to shield the companies from which they couldn't get the rights to these characters. Daisy's Third Eye In Super Smash Bros. Melee, Daisy's trophy has a little secret hiding within. By rotating the camera behind her hair, you can see that she has an additional eye on the back of her head. Has Daisy transcended her level of wisdom and successfully opened up her third eye? 
No, it's just a bug due to developer oversight. After all, Melee was only developed in 13 months, so a few glitches were bound to happen, and Nintendo ended up removing it from later versions of the game when the player's choice copies were released. Daisy's third eye still remains one of the most well-known glitches in gaming history nonetheless. Color TV Game This right here was Nintendo's first home video game console. It might not look like much, but that's because it isn't. See, first generation consoles didn't have interchangeable games like we do now. Instead, each console had one game. Nintendo, over the course of the Color TV game series, made five consoles. Two had a version of Pong called Light Tennis. One had a racing game called Speed Race. There was a console that had Breakout and one that had Computer Othello. It was by far the best-selling series of consoles during the first home console generation and set Nintendo up nicely to have even more success with their successor, the NES. Mario the Man vs. Mario the Idea Mario the Man vs. Mario the Idea might just be the greatest college essay ever written. This presumably real-looking essay supposedly written for a college philosophy class pokes fun at just how bad some students truly are and how easy it is to BS some of these classes. Going through it on your own is a journey in and of itself, but I'll do the honors of reading off some of my favorite parts. Everyone knows Mario is cool as f I believe it was Kant who said, experience without theory is blind, but theory without experience is mere intellectual play. And why do we think about him as fondly as we think about the mythical, non-existent Dr. Pepper? per chance. Not to mention the teacher's hilarious critiques like, you can't just say per chance. Unfortunately, or fortunately, this essay isn't real and was actually written by comedian Phil Jameson. While it may not be real, it sure is one of the greatest intellectual pieces of media critique ever written and deserves to be examined by future generations. Or maybe it's just a meme. Seattle Mariners. At the tail end of 1991, the MLB team, the Seattle Mariners, announced to be looking for a new owner. When an investor approached Nintendo to see if they were interested, Minoru Hiro Arakawa, son-in-law of Nintendo owner Hiroshi Yamauchi, responded with the following. My father-in-law says Seattle and the state of Washington have been very good to us. We have done extremely well here. We believe we owe something to the community. If you need $100 million to buy a baseball team, you got $100 million. Sure enough, on July 1st, 1992, Nintendo contributed $75 million towards an investor group who purchased the Mariners, giving Nintendo a majority share of the club. Over the years, Nintendo published four baseball games starring Mariners star hitter Ken Griffey. Jr. and released a special edition Seattle Mariners DS Lite, and released an app allowing DS users to order concessions to their seats from their DS. To this day, Nintendo still has a 10% minority share interest in the club. Love Tester The Love Tester was a toy by Nintendo made before they made video games. It would give a number score of 1 to 100 on how much the two people holding the sensors loved each other. While that might be a bit weird, it has surprisingly made many cameos in future Nintendo titles like WarioWare Twisted, Pikmin 2, and Animal Crossing. Gunpei Yakuza the creator of the love tester went on to say this wild quote that um well i'll just let you take a look the love tester came for me wondering if i could somehow use this to get girls to hold my hand i wound up holding hands with quite a few girls thanks to it of course somewhere along the line i started to feel like i wanted to do more than just hold hands playable master hand master hand is basically the final boss of almost every smash game as with most bosses in most video games there's no actual way to play as them in the game except there is there's a glitch in super smash brothers melee that allows players to control master hand it involves the player inserting their controller into port 3 of their gamecube and messing around with the name selection menu once in game you can actually control master hand and use all of his overpowered moves from classic mode. However, he controls much differently from all the other characters as all of his moves are weirdly mapped to the D-pad. Also, he can't die because it's literally impossible for him to fall off the stage as the only way to defeat him in classic mode is through an HP battle. While this is cool, it almost always ends in the game crashing. But years later, in Super Smash Bros. Ultimate, playable Master Hand once more became a reality in the World of Light campaign. To this day, this remains one of the coolest glitches in Nintendo's history, thanks once more to Melee's rush development. July 11th, 2017 On September 3rd, 2017, a video by Fire3Element showed that he had discovered an Easter egg on the Nintendo Switch system that would launch the NES game Golf. To do so, the user would have to set the date of their Switch to July 11th, 2017, and do the iconic Nintendo Switch hand gesture made famous by former Nintendo president Satoru Iwata. Once launched, the player could play a modified version of Golf that appeared to have included motion controls by the directions in the bottom corners. Unfortunately, this Easter egg was removed in the Switch's 4.0 update. However, once understanding the meaning behind this Easter egg, it actually makes good sense. See, the theory behind the Easter egg is that its inclusion in the Switch's code was seen as an omamori 
a Japanese tradition of carrying a personal item of someone who's passed to bring good luck and protection to the holder. Omomori are not supposed to be opened, so the entry point of the direct hand gesture and the date of Iwata's passing might have been seen as disrespectful, especially once it had garnered attention online. While it may no longer be on the Switch, I think this is one of the most heartwarming stories to come from Nintendo as Iwata was an inspiration to us all, and him protecting the users and giving luck to the Switch through this Easter egg was a very touching story. Hell Valley Sky Tree By going into the first person mode in Super Mario Galaxy 2's Shiver Burn Galaxy and looking up at the cliffs to the left, there's mysteriously three dark shadowy creatures staring down at you while you progress through the level. The weird thing is that they serve no purpose other than to add to the atmosphere, but you really need to go out of your way to search for them. For a while, nobody knew what they were called, but weirdly when checking the code, the developers named them Hell Valley sky trees. I guess it kind of makes sense as this level is set in a lava filled valley and these creatures are in the sky but what does this have to do with trees? Also by using a level editor you can see that there's actually four of these creatures instead of three because one of them is hidden behind the cliff. While we thought that would be the end of it there actually might have been a reference to them in the WarioWare minigame Weird Windmill. Upon completing the level a creature that looks extremely similar to the Hell Valley sky trees appears. It's not confirmed to be the same but the resemblance is uncanny. Mario is communist. We can all admit that MatPat has had some rather interesting videos over the years, but one that people love to poke fun at is Mario is communist. In this video, MatPat gives some of the most lackluster arguments like saying Mario's mustache was chosen because it's resemblance to Stalin, his hat is in a similar shape to the Soviet military's hats, and his signature color is red. Why red? Well, because he's communist, of course. One interesting comparison that he makes that I guess has some sort of ground to stand on is his argument that Wario is designed to be the anti-Mario, a fat, money-hungry capitalist stereotype. But this video just gets stupider and stupider as it goes on, pulling at straws like saying he's a working class plumber or that his signature weapon is a hammer. My favorite point by far is that when Mario rips down the Bowser flag and replaces it with his flag, that actually he's tearing down a peace sign in favor of a communist red star. Fortunately, the video plays out very sarcastically, but I remember actually being convinced it was real when I was a dumb child. It may not be the worst video, but it sure is a funny one. The Forbidden 7 Super Smash Bros. Brawl was the first game in the series in which past characters were cut. However, many of these cut characters, along with other possible newcomers, were actually found out to have been worked upon by leftover data in the files of the game. The seven scrapped characters found in these files have gone on to be referred as the Forbidden Seven. The three cut characters were Dr. Mario, Roy, and Mewtwo, and the four possible newcomers were Dixie Kong, Toon Zelda, Toon Sheik slash Tetra, and Plusle and Minin. Interestingly, Jigglypuff was also almost cut from Brawl's roster as well as Toon Link and Wolf. This was made evident by their exclusion in the Subspace Emissary campaign. The three cut characters apart from the Forbidden Seven all went on to return in Super Smash Bros. Ultimate alongside the Everyone Is Here campaign, while not one of the cut newcomers have ever been added to a subsequent game. Pokemon Z Throughout the entire history of Pokemon games, every single pair of games has had a third game come out with more content. Red and Green had Blue, Gold and Silver had Crystal, Ruby and Sapphire had Emerald, etc. However, Black and White took a different approach. Since this game was seen as a soft reboot of the series, Game Freak decided to make full-on sequels with Black 2 and White 2. So when Pokemon X and Y came out, everyone and their mother expected to either see X2 and Y2 or, more likely, Pokemon Z. It made perfect sense. There was never not a third game to accompany a pair of new games, and there was even a legendary Pokemon named Zygarde that surely would have been perfect for the front cover. Not to mention, the anime was literally called Pokemon XYZ. With Sword and Shield and Scarlet and Violet's new approach to DLC, it seems the days of the third definitive games are sadly behind us. Mario Battle Royale In 2019, YouTuber Inferno Plus created a fan-made version of the original Super Mario Bros. called Mario Royale. The game allowed you you and 74 other Marios to compete to be the last one standing, but it was sadly taken down by Nintendo for infringing on their intellectual property. Now, if this premise sounds familiar, that's because it is. Nintendo not one year later released a game called Super Mario Bros. 35 to commemorate the 35th anniversary of Mario. In it, you and 34 other Marios competed to be the last one standing until the game was taken down again by Nintendo. Not for infringing on their own IP, no, because they made it a limited time release that lasted all of six 
past months. So great, now no one gets to play Mario Battle Royale. Lateral thinking with withered technology. This convoluted phrase has been Nintendo's model for creating new products going back decades. It was first brainstormed by Gunpei Yokoi and basically outlines finding new innovative ways to excite audiences with old cheap technology that could easily be mass produced. Early smart decisions made using this thought process include the lack of color on the Game Boy to increase battery life and the use of abundant simple calculator tech to make Game & Watches. The philosophy has been the cornerstone of Nintendo's innovations basically since, with their generation old consoles being prime examples. The greatest use of lateral thinking with withered technology by far is the Nintendo Wii. The internals of a Wii are basically identical to a GameCube. However, by pivoting and striving for creativity over power, Nintendo created a cultural phenomenon. While Sony and Microsoft fight for the same market, Nintendo's philosophy keeps them relevant even when their competitors are succeeding. And that's really impressive. Twitch Plays Pokemon Twitch Plays Pokemon was an experiment in which a Twitch stream went live with Pokemon Red, and everyone in chat could input button presses using commands. The game was beaten in just 16 days and had a total of over 1.1 million participants. The game was made famous for sparking many funny memes and lore throughout the playthrough. Some iconic moments include the infamous ledge, Bloody Sunday in which 12 Pokemon were accidentally released, and of course, Lord Helix. There was even a controversy when the streamer changed the rules to democracy where players voted on the next move rather than just spamming it. Twitch Plays Pokemon wasn't just popular because of the rather unique concept, but because of the community it formed and the I was there feel the event had. Blarg Super Mario 64 Blargs are dinosaur-like enemies common in lava levels throughout the Super Mario series. However, they've never actually made an appearance in a 3D Mario title. That is, except for Super Mario 64. While they can't naturally spawn, they can be hacked into specific levels that have lava, like Lethal Lava Land and Bowser in the Fire Sea. They are fully modeled and cause damage, and even have programmed behavior to move towards Mario and sink under lava. One thing that they don't have, however, is a proper texture, as it seems that they did not move past the beta stage of development. You are Mr. Gay. Take a look at Super Mario Galaxy's box art. Now, while looking at it, look at the letters and pick out which ones have this little lens flare sparkle to them. Do you see anything fishy? That's because this logo holds a secret message. You are Mr. Gay. Now, obviously, Nintendo never intended this to be the case, but the fact that they could have chosen any arrangement of letters to have this sparkle and this is what they chose is just hilarious. Some say a marketing employee hid this message in there as a joke, but I'm pretty sure this is just a funny coincidence. But because of this rumor, many people have checked the sparkle letters on Super Mario Galaxy 2, and lo and behold, it spells nothing at first glance. But when you reverse the letters, the letters actually spell, yeah, I am, are you? Clearly responding to the first box art's message. If this isn't evidence that this isn't just a coincidence, I don't know what is. Pro Controller Hidden Message. Thanks to all game fans is a secret hidden message in all Switch Pro Controllers. By tilting the right control stick down and shining a bright light in between the stick and the cover, you can see through the dark translucent plastic the message, thanks to all game fans, clearly written on the inside of the controller. Little things like this just make my day, and the fact that Nintendo goes above and beyond to hide these little things in their products just makes me so happy. Super Mario Spikers Super Mario Spikers is a cancelled Mario sports title somewhat focusing on volleyball. I say somewhat because this cancelled game actually grew a lot of inspiration from WWE. There's even a small demo online that shows just how much it took, including Yoshi performing a pile driver on another Yoshi. Unfortunately, Nintendo found these animations to be too violent and turned down Next Level Games' idea. What's funny about all of this is that four years later, Next Level Games' next game they would release was the Punch-Out reboot on the Wii, a game way more violent than Mario Volleyball. ESRB Leak the ESRB leak is by far the most accurate and large leak to ever happen in the history of Super Smash Bros. One month before the first version of the game came out, a 4chan user posted an image with every previous character and supposed newcomer. Then a bit later, another user marked up the image with X's crossing out exactly all the past fighters that won't be returning and a question mark accurately predicting that Mewtwo was going to be in the game, but as DLC. Over the next few days, even more images and videos were posted online showing images of the fighter select screen, results screen and even a bit of gameplay. This leak was largely mocked at the time for just how bad the photoshopping job was done on Shulk's model as it looked extremely similar to Little Max. But in reality, it was all real. Down to the smallest details like Mewtwo being DLC, everything about this leak went on to be real.
Kirby was in Fortnite. In 2020, Fortnite uploaded a trailer to their YouTube channel titled Welcome to Party Royale, which showcased a new mode coming to the game. In one of the game's monitors, you can catch a glimpse of what appears to be Kirby, just randomly on the edge of the screen. When the trailer was later uploaded to the Xbox and PlayStation channels, this image of Kirby has been intentionally blurred out. Nobody really knows why Kirby was in this trailer in the first place, and three years later, there still hasn't been a Kirby or even Nintendo crossover in the game. Whether by pure accident or not, somehow, for some reason, Kirby ended up making an appearance in this trailer, and it can really only be left to speculation as to why. Nuts for Nintendo Nuts for Nintendo was a 2020 segment from 1988 that broke down Nintendo's ever-growing success at the time. It documented the shortages for new releases like Super Mario Bros. 2, and even questioned if Nintendo had intentionally been understocking their products as some sort of marketing ploy. Many of the parents and adults interviewed in the segment expressed concern that the games are rotting kids' brains or making them lazy or violent, it's really interesting to be able to go back and see what public perception of gaming was like decades ago. As back then, video games were still a relatively new concept to many people. I really wonder how mind-blown these people would be if they saw how massive the gaming industry has become now. GS Ball The GS Ball was an item most famous for its mysterious nature in the Pokemon anime. It was passed around many times, moving hands from Professor Ivy to Ash to Professor Oak, back to Ash, then to Kurt, and then ultimately forgotten about, a plot item that was supposedly going to have major ramification for the show, and that spanned across multiple episodes, was just shelved for what seemed like no reason. However, the reason for the GS Ball being dropped had to do with the fourth Pokemon movie. Celebi was the Pokemon that was going to be in the GS Ball, but since Celebi was going to be the star of that upcoming movie, they felt the GS Ball plot was redundant, so it was ultimately scrapped. Unused Switch eShop music Since the Wii, Nintendo's always had a virtual store for players to purchase and download games off of the internet. These channels and apps have always had their own music, with the Wii Shop channel theme becoming one of Nintendo's most iconic songs. However, with the Switch, the eShop has no music. As you navigate through the app, all you can hear is a few sound effects that correlate with your inputs. But did you know that the Switch actually does have its own eShop music? It was found in the Switch's files with this file name. If you give it a listen on YouTube, it's about everything you would expect from an eShop theme, a relaxing tune that you would hear in the background. So why is there no music when you browse the Switch's eShop? Well, most likely, Nintendo opted to cut the music to embrace minimalism. Maybe they thought music made people less likely to buy games or would make the eShop more laggy, but when the next Nintendo console releases, I really hope the eShop has music again because without music, it just feels too bland and underwhelming. The Grinch Leak On October 21st, 2018, an image surfaced on 4chan which was a picture of what appeared to be promotional material for Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. This image included a seemingly updated Smash Ultimate banner, which included seven characters that had not been announced for the game, such as the chorus kids from Rhythm Heaven and Isaac from Golden Sun. This became known as the Grinch leak because a render of the Grinch from the upcoming Illumination movie could be seen in the bottom right corner, and this render had also never been seen before. The internet was able to make out a poorly censored name on the picture, which said Eric Picard. From his LinkedIn profile, Profile, it stated that he worked for a company called Marina PLV, which listed Bandai Namco, the developers of Super Smash Bros. Ultimate, as a company they worked with on their website. Because of this, many fans came to the conclusion that a rogue employee at this company had just leaked the entire Smash roster. So many rumors began to spread as people became obsessed with this leak, with some fans even calling Marina PLV to try to dig up even more information. However, everyone's questions would be answered on November 1st, as a Smash Ultimate Direct was scheduled for that day. And it turned out, the entire thing was a hoax. Nintendo ended up revealing that Incineroar was the last character to be added to the base game, and he wasn't even part of the leak. A lot of this fake leak is still a mystery, but the fact that someone made a fake banner and connected it to a marketing company while apparently also having access to other promotional material for The Grinch, it's just so obscure and one of the most elaborate fake leaks in gaming. Mission in Snowdrift Land Mission in Snowdrift Land was a Flash game that was playable online in 2007. The game was made in a partnership with Nintendo to promote their games for the holiday season. It took an advent approach, with each day releasing a new level paired with a different Nintendo game to promote. After the holiday season, the game ended up disappearing from the internet, making a return in 2010 and then never returning again. Many fans who remembered the lost Flash game scoured the internet in search of it, and eventually, it was discovered that the game was actually playable on the developer's website due to a failed password system because Nintendo didn't own the 
rights to the game, the developers ended up re-releasing it on Steam after realizing there was a sudden demand for it. Earthbound 64 While Mother 3 has become infamous for never officially releasing in the West, there was once a point where it simply just never released at all. Earthbound 64, titled Mother 3 Fall of the Pig King in Japan, was a scrapped game that was planned for the Nintendo 64 DD. Then it was planned to be a traditional N64 game due to poor expectations of the 64 DD's performance. Finally, it was cancelled prior to the release of the GameCube. Before the project was revived in 2003, and released for the Game Boy Advance in 2006. Much of the game remained the same, with the plot itself being very similar. However, the gameplay is definitely affected due to the N64 offering entire 3D functionality. You can still view early footage of the original game that was planned, and we're all left to wonder how different the game would have been if it released for the N64 as originally intended. What's even more devastating though, is that Earthbound 64 was announced to have a North American release before it was cancelled, meaning Mother 3 has been long awaited by Westerners from the beginning, yet we still have never gotten to experience an official release. Nintendo forgot about Mario. In September of 2022, in response to a recent Nintendo Direct, a YouTuber Nintendo Land posted a video titled, Nintendo has forgotten about Mario. Pretty much the premise of the video was that a new mainland Mario game had not been released in several years and was speculating when a new one could be released. Nintendo fans on Twitter took the title and thumbnail of the video and began to poke fun at it. Whether it was the funny image of Mario sobbing that was used in the thumbnail, or the idea that Nintendo literally just forgot that their main mascot exists. Honestly, the video itself was pretty standard, as it was just a discussion on the status of the Super Mario franchise. Rather, people found the video's packaging to be a bit silly. However, some people became nonsensically angry over this, and Nintendo Land ended up privating the video and releasing a second video to address the controversy. Now, people will still bring up the video whenever Mario gets an announcement. Basically, if Nintendo even sneezes the word Mario, you can expect to see screenshots of this title and thumbnail on your timeline. Project M. When Super Smash Bros. Brawl released on the Wii, many fans of the previous Smash titles were disappointed. They felt as though the fast, exciting gameplay offered in Melee had turned into something slow and boring. As a result, dedicated fans began to create their own mod of the game, Project M, which offered gameplay more similar to Melee. The first version of this game was released in 2011, and updates rolled out through 2015. While many fans embraced the mod, Nintendo certainly did not. Through 2014 and 2015, several Smash tournaments dropped the game or refused to stream it, and many people speculated that this was due to Nintendo's intervention. In 2020, an anonymous twitlonger was posted that claimed that Twitch originally wanted to collaborate with Nintendo and the Smash community to create a series of tournaments that would be streamed on their website. However, Nintendo would not work with the community unless Project M was not present in the tournaments. Even though many tournaments dropped the mod, the circuit ultimately never happened anyway. After this twitlonger came to light, a few prominent members in the Smash community confirmed it was true. Some people believe that Nintendo's intentions were primarily to put an end to Project M, and they weren't really invested in the idea of collaborating with the Smash community from the beginning. Considering the lasting conflict between Nintendo and the Smash community today, none of this is too surprising. Japanese Raccoon Dog In Super Mario Bros. 3, the Super Leaf power-up turns you into Raccoon Mario, giving him raccoon-like ears and a tail. However, there's also a rarer power-up with similar traits, the Tanuki Suit. To many Western audiences, this might just appear to be some sort of full body raccoon suit. However, this is actually based on a different species, the Tanuki, also known as the Japanese raccoon dog. Mario's Tanuki suit introduced this animal to many people outside of Japan. However, Nintendo has featured this animal in other games. For instance, Animal Crossing's Tom Nook is a Tanuki, with his name actually being Tanukichi in Japan. Why Nintendo continues to put these creatures in their game is a mystery, but in Japanese mythology, the Tanuki are believed to be trickster animals. Tom Nook is often viewed viewed as an ill-intentioned debt collector across the Animal Crossing series, so perhaps him being a tanuki is fitting. UFO In World 1-3 of Super Mario 3D Land, there's a pair of binoculars that you would normally use to spot Toad, who will reward you with a star coin. However, there's something far more interesting that you can find with these binoculars, as a mysterious UFO can be seen flying off into the distance. This UFO isn't even a reference to anything in particular that you would expect to see in a Mario game. It's just a generic sprite of a flying saucer 
saucer. So the question is, why does this even make an appearance? Are the aliens real? Are they coming for Mario and everyone he loves? Realistically, it was just a developer having fun by including their own little Easter egg, but it's still ominous nonetheless. Star Fox 2 Star Fox 2 was a game that was planned to release for the Super Nintendo, like the original Star Fox. Just as the first game made use of the Super FX chip to feature more powerful graphics, this game was going to use an updated version of the chip, the Super FX 2. The game was planned to release in 1995, but as 3D graphics were on the rise, Nintendo decided to prioritize a Star Fox game for their upcoming 3D console. Because of this, the game was scrapped despite being 95% done and never made its way to the Super Nintendo. However, when the SNES Classic release, Nintendo decided to include the long lost title to promote the new console. For the first time, Star Fox 2 was officially made playable, and the game was later made playable through Nintendo Switch Online as well. Reggie vs. MatPat On the Game Theorist YouTube channel, they had a running series called Deadlock, which featured their host MatPat debating guests on certain gaming issues and topics. Funnily enough, one of their guests on the show was Reggie when he was still the president of Nintendo of America. In 2016, he was featured in an episode where he debated the benefits of motion controls in the Zelda franchise. Now, Reggie's appearance in this episode probably wasn't a big deal to him. I mean, you can pretty much tell that he is reading from a script as he talks, and his audio quality is also pretty bad. What I think is more interesting, though, is a later episode in which he discussed whether or not Nintendo should even continue to make hardware. For context, this was right before the release of the Nintendo Switch, and it's not as lighthearted as you might imagine. MatPat even brings up the fact that Nintendo's stock prices dropped when the Switch was announced to support his argument. So it's honestly surprising how comfortable Reggie was participating in this video. The video being scripted definitely helps, but it's still funny that it even happened in the first place. I mean, just the premise of the show being an authentic debate, it gives the impression that there's high stakes. Like Reggie could just lose and then Nintendo would have to cancel the Switch's launch entirely. Dragon King The Fighting Game Before Super Smash Bros, there was Dragon King The Fighting Game, a demo created by Masahiro Sakurai that made use of the N64's four-player capabilities. One of Sakurai's co-workers suggested that the game could benefit from using iconic Nintendo mascots as its characters, to make it feel less bland and also draw in more Nintendo fans. After Nintendo greenlit the project, it became the massive crossover series we know today. Some elements from the original Dragon King character's moveset were reused for Captain Falcon's moveset, as Super Smash Bros was the first time he was even playable without using the Blue Falcon. Mario disses Sony and does impressions. After E3 2007, a video surfaced on YouTube that showed a panel from the event featuring an interactable talking Mario. Now this was an animation that was connected to Charles Martinet, who was talking in real time. In this video, he does several impressions with Mario's voice, one of which has him praise Sony and then expand his nose like Pinocchio. There's many references to films in here as well, including an impression of Darth Vader and Jack from The Shining, replacing the character swears with a gold coin sound effect. It's a bit surprising that Nintendo would give this much freedom to Charles Martinet with their star mascot, but this video really exemplifies how connected Charles Martinet felt with his characters, as he's able to come up with his lines on a whim. Sound Font Albums In early 2023, a trend popped up online, with users recreating popular songs and albums using retro Nintendo game sound fonts, the most popular versions coming from Mario 64. The earliest two I could find date back to mid-2020, recreating Gangsta's Paradise and the Simpsons theme song. However, the biggest one by far is the Nirvana Nevermind Mario 64 sound font album, made by Something Is Real. At the date of this recording, this video has over 2.5 million views and is still climbing. This trend is exactly exactly what I love about the internet. On here, you can create the most niche and weird creative project that back in the day would have never gotten off the runway. But anyone with editing software in a dream can make it happen. Blue Yourself Speedruns Blue Yourself is a category of speedrunning in Mario Kart 8 Deluxe that requires the runner to start a race, get a spiny, and then throw it while in first place, hitting themselves in the process. What makes this category interesting is that you can only get a spiny shell when you are a certain distance away from first place, and spiny shells can only be obtained 30 seconds after a race has started. Much of the speedrun is left up to RNG, as an optimal run requires getting an early blue shell while also getting items that can quickly take you to first place. You can easily attempt dozens of runs in this category without even seeing a single blue shell, and this makes it one of the most tedious speedruns in the Mario Kart series. The world record currently stands just under 35 seconds. 
Luigi wins by doing nothing. On October 12th, 2009, a YouTuber named Clyde Storm uploaded a video titled, Mario Party 2, Luigi wins by doing absolutely nothing. In the description, he claims that this was an experiment to see how many minigames he could win without touching the controller, pitting Luigi against three easy CPUs. Due to both RNG and the poor performance of the computers, he was able to win a surprising amount of these games. This has since turned into a trend across all Mario Party games, sometimes with different minigames and sometimes with more difficult CPUs. However, what is consistent is that it's always Luigi and he's always doing nothing to win. As for why it's Luigi, I have no idea, but given his awkward nature, it's kind of funny to imagine Luigi just stumbling his way into a victory. Gary Bowser Gary Bowser was part of a group known as Team Executor. This group sold products that promoted piracy, including chips that allowed users to download Switch games illegally. He was sentenced to 40 months in prison and now has to pay over $14 million in damages as a result of his crimes. While he wasn't even the most prominent member of his group, he was the only one who was convicted in the US. The funny thing to come out of this is that the guy shares his name with Nintendo's most iconic villain. The idea that Bowser has to pay millions of dollars to Nintendo for committing crimes against them is hilarious, and from Nintendo's perspective, this guy might be more evil than Bowser himself, given how much they despise piracy. Microsoft wants to buy Nintendo. In 2000, as the original Xbox was planned for release, Microsoft was in severe need of one thing, games. Because of this, they made an attempt to acquire several other video game publishers, with their plan being to have them make their games for the Xbox. One of these companies was Nintendo, and when the two companies met, it definitely didn't go in Microsoft's favor. Instead, Nintendo's representatives didn't take the meeting seriously at all. Kevin Backus, a director behind the attempt of acquiring the company, went on to describe it as, imagine an hour of someone just laughing at you. Needless to say, Microsoft did not end up purchasing Nintendo. However, the story doesn't end here. An email recently surfaced from 2020 from Microsoft's Phil Spencer, where he discussed the possibility of acquiring the company now, describing Nintendo as the prime asset in gaming. So it seems that Microsoft has never given up on their dream. Wreck-It Ralph was robbed. It's no secret that Nintendo is very strict on how their characters appear outside of their control, but despite this, Bowser appeared in the November 2nd, 2012 film Wreck-It Ralph. Wreck-It Ralph was a film by Disney Animation Studios, focusing on mostly fictional arcade games, but it did include some cameos of actual video game legends such as Qbert, Sonic, and, well, Bowser. Wreck-It Ralph was nominated for the Best Animated Film Oscar, but it lost to Disney Pixar's Brave. A lot of people believed that Wreck-It Wreck-It Ralph was robbed, because Brave had a lukewarm reception at best, whereas Wreck-It Ralph was a surprise hit for Disney Animation Studios. Apparently Nintendo and Bowser agreed, as during the Oscars, Nintendo tweeted out, and now, a special message from Bowser, hashtag Oscars, with the image stating, "Rar, Wreck-It Ralph got robbed. This is just very odd, not really something you see Nintendo do often, but hey, I mean, they're not wrong. Nvidia Shield Wii games. The Nvidia Shield is an Nvidia console that can play PC games, but when it released in China, they were able to include some HD remasters of Wii games as a part of Nvidia's deal with Nintendo to make the chipset for the Nintendo Switch. Super Mario Galaxy, The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess, Donkey Kong Country Returns, and New Super Mario Bros. Wii were just some of the games that had the HD treatment on the Nvidia Shield. Mario Kart Wii HD with online play was announced, but no gameplay was ever shown, and it's safe to say it just never came to fruition as the shield failed in China and all the games were delisted. It's funny to think that an official HD version of Mario Kart Wii with online play way after the Wii online servers were shut down was almost a real thing. Mean Girls DS Mean Girls DS was a game published by 505 Games and set to be released in Europe on September 11th, 2009. A United States release was scheduled for April 20th, 2010, but both were cancelled at the last minute. For unknown reasons, the game never surfaced digitally or physically since its planned release and no copies were accounted for. In fact, five random screenshots were all the video game preservation community had until 2021, when YouTuber Bob Dunga uploaded a video saying she had it, but her ROM was bugged. After working with a programmer named To My Shadow, they were able to get the ROM playable, solving the mystery and preserving this bizarre licensed game.
Mario Movie Anime. In the 1980s, there was an anime for Mario. Super Mario Bros. The Great Mission to Rescue Princess Peach never ended up leaving Japan, but the entire thing is available on YouTube right now, restored to 4K by a video restoration fan group known as Kaneko Video. Interestingly enough, it's widely believed that Super Mario Bros. The Great Mission to Rescue Princess Peach is one of, if not the earliest isekai anime to involve a virtual video game world. Minimum Captures Mario games are always huge for the speedrunning and challenge community, and 2017's Super Mario Odyssey was no different. On top of being one of the most speedrun games of all time, various communities started cropping up around self-imposed challenges, one of the main ones being Super Mario Bros. Odyssey's Minimum Capture Run. Arguably popularized by famous YouTuber SmallAnt1, Minimum Captures is just what it sounds. Try to beat the game using as little captures as possible. Given that capturing is by far Super Mario Odyssey's main mechanic, it seemed impossible to avoid most of the intended captures, but somehow this community found a way. There are now only three required captures in the game, which is an absolutely insane milestone. New Super Mario Bros. Wii's Peach's Castle. It's no secret that Nintendo hated YouTube back in the day. From copyright claiming any video of people uploading footage from their games, to Sakurai outright blaming YouTubers as the reason he never made another Super Smash Bros. Subspace Emissary, Nintendo was not a fan of the video sharing platform in the 2000s and 2010s. Ironically, in New Super Mario Bros. Wii's Peach's Castle, Nintendo included hint videos very similar to the ones you'd see on YouTube today. It could be argued that Nintendo did YouTube before it was cool, as they even showed off exploits in their own games such as infinite one-up glitches, hidden secret exits, difficult star coins, and the like. Anti-piracy screens. Certain video games have anti-piracy measures that are able to detect when a user is playing on a pirated or illegitimate copy. Certain games will let players continue playing or modify their game, making it so difficult to the point where it's no longer playable, but most games will just send you to an anti-piracy screen. Some of these screens can be somewhat scary or off-putting, like in the case of Donkey Kong Country 2, which just reuses that game's game over screen. Because of this, many fan-made anti-piracy screens went viral, with more Mario Party DS being one of the most famous and well-made ones depicting the Mario Party characters in jail. Wii Pizza. The Wii was home to many different channels that you could purchase on the Wii Shop channel. One of the most interesting of these was the Deme channel, which let you order pizzas. This was seriously just an Uber Eats style delivery that you could download as an app on your Wii. It only had a full launch in Japan, but in North America you could get Domino's, so I guess that's better than nothing. This bizarre premise is kind of hilarious, and there are YouTube videos of people ordering a pizza from their Wii in the year 2023. That's just kind of absurd to think about. 501. What if you could buy every game for a Nintendo DS, Game Boy, NES at once? Well, old cartridge-based systems would have these illegitimate flash carts that had a ton of storage housing many different, mostly pirated versions of Nintendo games. For example, here I have a 500 something in one DS cartridge that has almost every game you could ever want to and a lot of games you would never want to play on a Nintendo DS. Funnily enough, the DS actually recognizes this as a random SpongeBob game, but once you click into it, you get a menu, which allows you to play any one of the DS games downloaded onto the cartridge. Nintendo is definitely not a fan of these at all, but with a lot of these older systems, there's really no way to stop these from spreading. McDonald's DS game. E-Crew development program, known unofficially as the McDonald's training game, was a DS game used to, well, train McDonald's employees. This was only ever used in the Japanese division of McDonald's, and it was never intended to be released to the public. Despite the fact that it's just a training game, there's actually a decent amount of depth here, with a unique OST, pretty decent graphics for a DS title, and relatively fun and engaging gameplay. YouTuber Nick Robinson bought a copy of the game sold for $3,000 at auction in 2020, and while it needed a password in order to unlock it, the password was discovered through the game's data in a hex editor, and now anyone can download and play the ROM for the McDonald's Japanese training game early Splatoon concepts. Splatoon was Nintendo's first new IP in over a decade, so naturally it went through many iterations. It started off with simple blocks of tofu in a tech demo, but the characters graduated to bunnies. The idea of Yoshi being the playable character was picked because he can change colors and it fit with the game's aesthetic, but they wanted to stick with making a new IP and eventually they settled on the right idea. Inklings and Octolings are the perfect characters for this wacky, wonderful, colorful shooter. Marty the Thwomp. On Mario Kart 64, 
towards Bowser's castle, there's this weird green thwomp behind bars. Given his unique green color and the fact that he laughs at racers, this thwomp developed a bit of a cult following and it left players to name the thwomp Marty and create rumors and fake hoaxes saying he was playable. Funnily enough, he's only actually green because the thwomps are normally blue and there's yellow lighting above creating the green hue. And obviously he was never intended to be playable or even really noticed. He's just a decoration on the course. Beta Pokemon. Despite the fact that there are over 900 Pokemon that exist, there are many more beta Pokemon that were planned for release in various games, but eventually cut. Most of these beta versions were shown the light through demos of older games leaking and massive leak of internal Game Freak documents. For example, Pokemon Gold and Silver had a demo on the 1997 Nintendo Space World trade show game floor, and it eventually leaked in 2018, showing off a bunch of new designs for baby Pokemon that never ended up making the cut, and an entire different line for the Firestarter. Of course, we ended up getting the Cyndaquil line instead. One of the most interesting ones to me is Porygon 2, made up of smoother spheres than Porygon's, well, polygons. Mario 7 Grandad. Primitive Mario 7 is a notorious hack of The Flintstones, The Rescue of Dino and Hoppy, which was an NES game released in 1992. This hack replaced Fred Flintstone's sprite with this version of Mario, replaced some of the credits names with X's, and included a level select, which was just not present in the original game. This relatively obscure hack gained internet infamy through streamer Vine Sauce and Siva Gunner's rips of Mario tunes with the Flintstones theme. Deflated Pikachu. The 2017 Pokemon World Festival had a dance number with a bunch of different Pikachus dancing. Sadly, the centermost Pikachu started deflating, and what happens next was hilarious. The performer in the costume immediately got mobbed and then rushed off by men in suits. Sadly, the fate of that Pikachu is not known today, leading many to assume the worst. <laughs> Unlicensed Smash Bros. Mobile game ripoffs are common, but it's hard to find such blatant ones on Nintendo because they're very strict with their copyrights. Super Fighter M All Star is about as blatant as it gets. This game has an absolutely crazy roster, including characters that never made Super Smash Bros, like Darkrai, The Brutals, and is that evil Mario? Obviously, this was taken down all the way back in March of 2021, but if you want to see more of what this game has to offer, Video Game Donkey has a hilarious video on his channel all about it. Nintendo sells out of Earthbound. Between the NES Classic, Amiibo, and Super Mario 3D All-Stars, it's no secret that Nintendo is no stranger to artificial scarcity. This is when Nintendo takes something and doesn't produce as much of it, or makes it only available for a limited time in order to drive up the demand of this product. The most egregious example of this came in April of 2015 when they sold out of Earthbound for the Wii U. Earthbound was a digital game, and they sold out. That's right, Earthbound was a Club Nintendo reward, which was an old Nintendo rewards program that was discontinued, and in April of 2015, anyone who wanted to redeem their reward points for Earthbound was getting a sold out message. How do you sell out of a digital game? I don't know, but only Nintendo would be able to find a way to do that. It's just ridiculous. Mario 3 for the PC. Id Software of Quake and Doom fame coded a demo port of Super Mario Bros. 3 for the NES on PC in under a week hoping to get a contract with Nintendo to make it an official port. Of course, you can probably guess this ended up getting rejected, but Id worked around this using the technology they made in the port for their hit classic Commander Keen. The port later got unearthed in 2021 and is currently preserved in the Museum of Play, which is great for preservationists everywhere. Galaxy Zero Coins. Super Mario Galaxy has purple coin missions, which suck, and basically all you have to do is play through a level and get all 100 purple coins. However, on two specific levels, being Battle Rock Galaxy and Dreadnought Galaxy, if you somehow get through the entire level without getting a single purple coin, Guillermo at the end of the level remarks that you must have done it on purpose and then straight up kills you. Pretty scary stuff. Sky Skipper. Sky Skipper was a Nintendo arcade game from 1981 where you fly a plane and drop bombs on gorillas. Shigeru Miyamoto was a designer on this game, but unfortunately it never got a wide release because it tested terribly. Apparently the game was just not fun, so cabinets ended up being converted into Popeye machines with only one cabinet remaining left in the Nintendo archives. Luckily, enthusiasts were able to scan and photograph the cabinet, source one of the four remaining arcade boards, and therefore build a faithful restoration preserving this game in its original form for Ever. You can now also play Sky Skipper on the Arcade Archive series. 
Mario Ice Capades. Mario Ice Capades was a live action Super Mario on Ice television special that aired in December of 1989. The show starts with Jason Bateman and Alyssa Milano playing Super Mario Bros. But then out of nowhere, the game starts to glitch and the rest of the show takes place inside the game. The plot involves Bowser trying to infect computers with viruses using the NES and even includes a rap at one point. The outfits are quite horrifying, especially this stunned looking Peach. Interestingly, a flag was given out at the event that had characters from Super Mario Bros. 2, but they were not actually found anywhere in the actual show. Original Cat Mario Cat Mario, also known as Sayoban Action, is a parody Mario Rage game released in 2007. This game is called Cat Mario because, well, instead of playing as Mario, you actually play as this white cat. The game only has six levels, but don't let that fool you. This game is extremely trolly. This was Mario Maker troll levels before Mario Maker existed. The developer actually made the game for a cultural festival at his college where it became the most popular work shown. A video of the demo went viral online and the rest was history. Later on, he went on to expand the game to 18 levels as the game was ported to the iPhone and Android. While this is all fine and dandy, I have a conspiracy that Nintendo actually wanted to bury this game's search results by making the cat power up in Super Mario 3D World. Luckily, that failed because if you look up Cat Mario today, the first search result is still this masterpiece of troll gaming. I've never played Metroid. At 12.58 in Scott the Waz's Mario Sports Superstars video, Scott goes on to have one of the greatest bits in the history of the Nintendo community. In the clip, he makes fun of Nintendo YouTubers, specifically the ones who are a part of the Nintendo Creators Program who suck up to Nintendo. The overexcited talking and the absurd amounts of merch are great, but five seconds in, he drops a line they'll go on to shatter my illusion with Nintendo YouTube forever. This is another Nintendo fan here. You can tell I love Nintendo by my ability to buy merchandise. I've never played Metroid. I've never played Metroid, and most other Nintendo YouTubers you know probably haven't either. They're all lying to you and don't believe anyone. Mainline Mario Conundrum. Quick question, how many mainline Mario games are there? Feel free to pause the video and find your number. So obviously you've got Super Mario Bros. 1, Super Mario Bros. 3, and Super Mario World. So which one of the Super Mario Bros. 2s are canon? Or are they both canon? What about Super Mario Land 2 and 3? Obviously all the 3D Mario games are, but does 64 DS count? Also, is Yoshi's Island Super Mario World 2 or not? This absurd conundrum has led to insane amounts of argument online with people trying to figure out what exactly is a mainline Mario game. This leads us to the classic Yan Masali video in 2021, where he puts the question to rest through a community survey where the answer is still pretty murky. But in the thumbnail, he says there's like 18. And at the end of the video, he shows us that list of 18, which for me, I completely agree with. But it's a super interesting video that dives into the discrepancies between between fans about the arbitrary title of Mainline that is both extremely interesting and entertaining. Pokemon Pink Pokemon Pink was a scrapped Gen 1 Pokemon game that would have been the counterpart to the Pikachu-headed Pokemon Yellow. This game would have been similar to Pokemon Yellow, except that instead of getting a starter Pikachu, you would have gotten either a Jigglypuff or a Clefairy. No one really knows which one Game Freak was leaning towards, but many people speculate that it would have been Jigglypuff, as they were probably the second most popular Pokemon in the anime. But facts have led me to believe that it would have actually been Clefairy. Clefairy was early on considered to be the mascot of Pokemon before Pikachu was chosen, and was also the main character in the manga. It also could have been nothing at all, as the only hint at the game's existence could have been seen as just a placeholder package. Since the game was built off of Pokemon Red and Blue, they needed a placeholder color to make the game work. Either way, this is still a neat bit of Pokemon history that not many people might know. Pyoro is a character from the WarioWare series, but y'all don't care about that. What you care about is Pyoro the Leaker. Over the history of Nintendo, we've had many leakers online, whether it be on 4chan, Twitter, or anywhere else. Sometimes they're right, most of the time they're not, and other times there's one person who gets something right and then disappears into the ether. But there remains only one leaker who has never missed. And when I say never missed, I mean never missed. Their name is Pyoro. Pyoro's first tweet came in September of 2022, and since then he has proceeded to leak some of the biggest games and titles Nintendo has ever announced. Don't believe me? Take a look at these two tweets that were made just days before Super Mario Wonder was announced. Insane, right? My favorite thing about Pyoro is his distaste for other leakers, mocking them and telling them to delete their account when they get stuff wrong. Right now, we're still lucky to have Pyoro, and I'm not sure how long this reign is gonna last, as the Nintendo ninjas are definitely looking for him. But if there's anyone that can outmaneuver them, it's definitely Pyaro. Splatoon Truck Robbery. Okay, this might be my favorite topic on the iceberg for just how stupid but also serious this whole fiasco was. As many of you guys know, the original Splatoon for the Wii U released with three amiibo. 
Inkling Girl, Inkling Boy, and The Squid. However, in North America and Europe, you couldn't just buy the Squid Amiibo. Instead, you either had to buy a bundle with three Amiibo in North America, or buy the game bundle with the Squid Amiibo in Europe. Now, this shouldn't be a huge problem. While it's a bit shady from a company standpoint, Nintendo's no stranger to artificial scarcity. But scarcity of this Amiibo in the UK was about to hit a whole new level. See, on the day of Splatoon's release, it was revealed that Game, the biggest video game retailer in UK, announced that the truck transporting all the Splatoon bundles from Nintendo warehouse had been stolen. Not just the amiibo, but the entire truck. And the crazy thing is, they were never caught. Game never got a restock on the bundles and offered an inkling boy or girl amiibo for free. But the squid amiibo was never sold in Game's UK stores. It's crazy that after all these years, nobody knows whatever happened to this truck or all the squid amiibo that went along with them. But they're definitely out there. Those squid amiibo are living among us. Defective Amiibo. Defective Amiibo, or factory defects to be exact, are extremely rare Amiibo that go for an insane amount of money. Now, when I say defective, I don't mean broken Amiibo. Nobody really wants those. I mean defects. Little quirks or manufacturing errors that could have only been done in the factory. There are really cool ones out there like Peach with No Legs or my personal favorite, Double Arm Cannon Samus. The demand for these was huge during the Amiibo boom. You remember that legless Peach I brought up a second ago? That went for $25,100 dollars on eBay. Who the hell has that much disposable income to buy on Amiibo? Unofficial NES cartridges. During the early years of Nintendo, they were known for their official seal of quality to ensure customers that any game they buy is, is going to be of the utmost quality, unlike the years prior on previous systems where there was just a bunch of shovelware that was barely playable. However, this didn't stop unlicensed games from slipping through the cracks. Since the hardware on the NES was fairly simple, many independent developers who couldn't get licensing from Nintendo made unofficial cartridges to sell their games. Funnily enough, one of these games was actually Tetris. These cartridges are easy to spot as they usually look nothing like a proper NES cartridge. Most of them are pretty bad, but they're also an interesting part of Nintendo's history. Steamroller. While Nintendo might have disliked unlicensed games, they absolutely hated counterfeit games. How much might you ask? Oh, I don't know, maybe taking an entire steamroller and driving over 10,000 copies of counterfeit games in the Netherlands. These images don't even look real. They look like something cooked up by a Twitter account using one of those AI generators. It's actually insane that Nintendo did this, but I guess it was for a good cause. Electric Soldier Porygon. During the 38th episode of the first Pokemon anime titled Electric Soldier Porygon, 600 children in Japan experienced photosensitive epileptic seizures. This event was nicknamed Pokemon Shock, and sent many parents into hysterics. The Pokemon anime would go on to have a four-month hiatus in which one Christmas episode would be postponed until the next year and ultimately aired out of order to avoid confusion. Also, a New Year's holiday special that would have taken place two weeks later was cut and never released. To this day, nobody has ever seen this holiday special. Because of this whole fiasco, Porygon has been banned from the Pokemon anime. Neither Porygon or either of its evolutions have ever made an appearance since this episode. However, Porygon didn't actually cause the explosion that caused the seizures. That was actually Pikachu. A tweet made by the official Pokemon Twitter account poked fun at this in 2020 by saying, Porygon did nothing wrong, but weirdly enough, it was taken down just moments later. While Porygon might have not done anything wrong, this episode has never aired in any country since its premiere, and I don't see it airing anytime soon. Meme Run Remember Nintendo's seal of quality? Well, apparently Nintendo doesn't, as this abomination was allowed on their system. Meme Run is a side-scrolling endless adventure game that, who am I kidding? This game was clearly a troll to garner attention and poke fun at the Wii U's low barrier of entry. But my god, I love it for that. Five seconds of gameplay and you can just tell, this game was built using the highest quality of MLG era memes. From the quick scopes to the air horns, to the cheerful swag at the beginning of each level. However, the game was taken off the Wii U eShop three months after its launch for using the troll face without the creator's permission. While Meme Run no longer exists, its memory lives on with Meme Run 2. But nothing will quite top the slap in the face to Nintendo that was the original Meme Run. The tragedy of Gunpei Yokoi. After many years of success at Nintendo and building the foundational model of lateral thinking with withered technology, Gunpei Yokoi was ready to move on from Nintendo, having an extremely successful career with maybe one hiccup along the way. His contributions are up there with Miyamoto and Iwata, but many people forget his work because of what happens next. Yokoi moved on to create his own company in 1996 called Kodo. In just one year, he created a digital pet companion device. 
known as the Tomagachi, and it didn't seem to be stopping. That was until later that year when he and his coworker were driving on the highway when they rear-ended a truck. Yukoi jumped out of the car to assess the damage and was struck by a passing car. He would pass away two hours later at the age of 56. Gunpei Yukoi was one of the most creative men to work for Nintendo and brought them into the gaming world. While he may no longer be with us, his legacy lives on through Nintendo. Lavender Town Syndrome. Lavender Town Syndrome is a creepypasta that garnered traction in the early 2010s. Its premise is basically that the music heard here in Lavender Town has high pitch frequencies that can only be heard by children. These frequencies cause Lavender Town Syndrome, a mysterious illness that would lead children to experience headaches, extreme irritation, and in some cases, death. While this is obviously fake, I did remember hearing about it when I was younger and actually being really scared. It makes sense. The music is super weird and uncomfortable to listen to. Not to mention, Lavender Town is the level in the game notorious for the Pokemon Tower, which is basically a Pokemon graveyard, but it's totally not real right? Nintendo's creator program. In the early days of YouTube, one of the most popular forms of content was Let's Plays. Basically, YouTubers would post full playthroughs of games either with or without commentary. Nintendo ended up taking issue with this form of content as they would often flag the videos that featured their games, as they felt because they owned the rights to the games, it was unfair for others to profit off their gameplay. Many fans thought Nintendo's stance was ridiculous, as Let's Plays were essentially free advertisement for their games, and in response, Nintendo decided to compromise. They released a that detailed plans for the Nintendo Creator Program. To become a member of this program, content creators would have to cooperate with Nintendo by adhering to strict guidelines, including submitting videos to Nintendo for approval before uploading them. Even with approval, Nintendo would still take a large cut of the creator's ad revenue, and this creator program was also subject to a lot of backlash. In 2018, Nintendo repealed their creator program while they had recently entered a new era after the launch of the Nintendo Switch. Nintendo does not generally claim content, with some notable exceptions. For instance, Nintendo has recently taken down videos featuring mods of their games, and will occasionally strike channels for re-uploading their music. Multiplayer Punch-Out. While Punch-Out is a boxing game that you'd assume at first glance would be perfect for multiplayer, it really isn't. It's a rhythm game disguised as a fighting game. However, there was a multiplayer mode in Punch-Out for the Wii, but did you know there was actually a secret two-player mode in Super Punch-Out? No? Well, that's because it was hidden in the game for over 28 years without anybody ever finding it. We can't go one day without hearing spoilers for a new game, but this massive hidden mode inside of one of Nintendo's biggest titles for the SNES had a multiplayer mode that went untouched for almost three decades. To access it, all you need to do is enter the free match mode, and while on the character info screen, have player two hold B and Y and have player one press start, and you'll be in a two player fight. Crazy thing is, player two can access all the special moves performed by the fighters just by hitting down B. This to me is one of the coolest discoveries ever found in gaming. How does something like this just slip through the cracks? It's rumored that this wasn't actually intended to be in the game and was just a way for developers to test out the fights. But still, it's something super cool. Miyamoto can't bike. Miyamoto is not allowed to ride a bike to work. Why? Because his safety is way too important to the well-being of Nintendo. He's also not allowed to walk to work. I guess it makes a bit of sense, but when you want him to get some exercise so he's healthy and lives longer that way, it seems a bit overprotective by Nintendo, but hey, I'm not gonna judge. Crow 64. Crow 64, also known as Catastrophe Crow, was an ARG created by Adam Butcher. It starts off just like any other overly excited video game YouTuber would, with a nostalgic talk about the N64 era, the history of Opus Interactive, and the development hell that the game and its creator went through, showing real promotional material and images alongside it. It then cuts back to Adam saying that this game has been lost for over 20 20 years, but that he had just bought the only remaining copy of it off someone on eBay. The copy definitely looks like a developer cartridge. It even has a torn Opus Interactive sticker on it. This alone would make me believe that this is one of the most in-depth and well put together ARGs that I've ever seen. But then it cuts to him actually playing the game. It's so realistic that for the longest time, I thought this guy made his own game just for this ARG, but it was all animated. And my God, this animation is so realistic. I won't spoil the rest of the video because, well, it's crazy, but if you haven't seen this video, make sure to watch it after this. The Impossible Coin Super Mario 64 is the collectathon game to birth the genre of collectathon games, 7 stars per level, and the 25 castle stars. Some would say this is Super Mario 64 100%ed, but there's actually one more collectible that often gets overlooked, and that's coins. Most people get the 100 coins per level and move on with their lives, but there's actually way more than the 100 coins in each level. If you truly want 100% Super Mario 64, you have 
enough to collect every single coin in every single level. That's a total of 2,092. Only 2,091 are obtainable. The final impossible coin is hidden here in Tiny Huge Island. It looks like it should have shot out with the other coins, but got stuck. It's possible to glitch through the walls and get to it, but in reality, it's just easier calling it a day at 2091. Or for that matter, just stick to 120 stars. Radar Scope. Radar Scope was a 3D Space Invaders-like arcade shooter that happened to be just one of Nintendo's biggest commercial failures in the arcade industry. It was so bad, in fact, that Nintendo of America just had these cabinets laying around in storage with nobody wanting to buy them. Nintendo of America's president, Minoru Arakawa, asked president of Nintendo, Hiroshi Yamauchi, to take the cabinets back and design a whole new game using the unsold radar scope cabinets. In return, Nintendo made Donkey Kong. Now, just imagine what happens if Radar Scope succeeds. When I mean succeed, I don't mean Donkey Kong success. That's on a whole nother level. I mean breaks even and they get a bit of extra cash alongside it. Donkey Kong and Mario just straight up don't exist. Maybe Nintendo does exist, but they are by no means the juggernauts of gaming that they are now. Also, Donkey Kong's success almost single-handedly helped fund the creation of the NES. So if there's no Donkey Kong, Mario, or NES, then what does Nintendo do when the video game market crashes in the West? Nothing. They don't have the cash. Without Radar Scope failing, the entire video game market in the West falls behind decades. No NES means no Sega vs Nintendo, which means no N64 losing to the PlayStation. Yeah, maybe the PlayStation does make it overseas, but do people take video games seriously? No. No one took video games seriously until like a decade ago. So without Radar Scope failing, we get no Donkey Kong, no Mario, no NES, no Sega vs Nintendo, no PlayStation vs N64, and no Nintendo YouTube. That's right, if Radar Scope succeeds, I would have had to get a real job. And fuck that. Blue Pikmin Abuse Nintendo hates Blue Pikmin. Yes, no joke, Nintendo has an unexplained hatred towards Blue Pikmin specifically. Just look at any promotional material across the Pikmin series. You can almost always spot a Blue Pikmin suffering somewhere in the background. Pikmin Bloom has completely embraced this tradition, as every single one of its unique loading screens features a Blue Pikmin in distress. It leaves many people wondering why Nintendo is torturing the Blue Pikmin variants specifically. Personally, my guess would be that it was just a coincidence in Pikmin 1's box art, reused in Pikmin 2's box art for consistency, and then it became a running gag eventually, but who knows? Who are you running from? Before the DSi, Nintendo previously offered a camera for one of their earlier systems. An accessory called the Game Boy Camera could be inserted into the Game Boy's cartridge slot and allowed users to take photos from their portable device. The accessory also included several minigames that would interact with the camera. One of these games has an interface that's similar to the battle mechanics in the Pokemon games. If you click the run option, you would usually see this screen, which states you are now crossing the equator and features a picture of Africa. However, sometimes you can get a different image, featuring a man whose picture has been edited using the Game Boy Camera's features. Many people find these pictures to be unsettling, but what's even more unsettling is their captions, including who are you running from and don't be silly. While it might seem like this easter egg was included to traumatize children, this was probably done in good fun to make the user laugh. I mean, the music that plays during these screens isn't creepy at all, and is instead just the type of silly music you would expect to hear in any other video game. It's unknown who the people featured in these pictures are, but many speculate that the developers behind the Game Boy Camera were just taking pictures of random people around the office one day and decided to include these images as a funny easter egg. Pietro. There's actually a third Mario brother. At least that's what one episode of the Super Mario Bros. Super Show may have you believe. In this episode, Mario and Luigi are greeted by a man named Pietro, who wears a hat with the letter P on it, matching the style of the other Mario brothers. He claims that he's their long lost older brother and that he's finally returned to Brooklyn to embrace his family after traveling the world for many years. Many fans were likely shocked to see this. Considering how iconic Mario and Luigi are, it's awfully strange that this was the first time we heard of their other brother. However, the episode later reveals that Pietro was a con artist who simply wanted to sell the Mario Bros plumbing business and take most of the money for himself. So yeah, there is not actually a third Mario brother. But the fact that this idea was entertained in an episode of the Super Mario Bros Super Show nonetheless is pretty hilarious. Miyamoto Cat Peach Around the time of Super Mario 3D World's release, Miyamoto was featured in an interview about the game. And when discussing Princess Peach's inclusion, 
conclusion, he went on to say that one of the reasons she was playable was because he wanted to see what Peach would look like as a cat, because quote, cat women are sexy. I refuse to elaborate on this any further. Ben drowned. In September of 2010, a 4chan user posted a long essay, detailing how he believed he had a cursed copy of Majora's Mask. After purchasing the game from a yard sale, he noticed a file for the game named Ben. On his own file though, he noticed that something was off about the game, as the NPCs would regularly refer to his name as Ben as well. After deleting Ben's file to see if this would resolve the issue, he then was referred to by no name whatsoever, making him think the game was bugged. However, after he attempted the fourth day glitch in the game, it started to behave much weirder. Characters were out of place or missing, and Link was trapped in areas that he should not even be in. Eventually, he tries to die to escape an area by drowning, and when this happens, the game goes berserk. The happy mask salesman flashes on the screen, a song begins to play in reverse. The entire thing is really creepy. The poster concluded that the former owner of the cartridge was a kid named Ben, who had drowned before he was ever able to finish the game. After his death, Ben's soul haunted this cartridge, which caused the game's mysterious behavior. This 4chan post has become a popular creepypasta since it was published, but one of the most interesting things about it is that the poster followed it up with videos of the supposed cartridge that portrayed exactly what he was describing happening in the game. Including these videos made the story feel more authentic and definitely contributed to its popularity. Maybe the story is legitimate, but considering Majora's Mask is already considered to be one of the creepiest Zelda games, Games. Most likely, the poster went out of their way to modify the game and edit footage to make for a good creepypasta. Linkle. Linkle is one of the strangest characters in the Zelda franchise. During the development of Hyrule Warriors for the Wii U, the developers considered including a female version of Link, but ultimately the idea was scrapped and didn't make its way into the game. However, original concept art for the character was featured in the Hyrule Warriors art book, and many fans were disappointed that the character wasn't included in the game, as they thought having a female version of Link was a neat idea. Because of this, when Hyrule Warriors Legends was being developed for the 3DS, Nintendo revived the character and ended up including her in the game, giving her two crossbows as her main weapons. Something about there being a female version of Link, it really feels like some sort of fan creation that you wouldn't expect to see in an actual video game. But Nintendo deciding to put a character in their game, simply because fans were intrigued by her concept art, is a pretty cool story. Throwing Sega under the bus in Congress Between 1993 and 1994, several US Senate hearings took place, which discussed a growing concern regarding violence in video games. These hearings ended up leading to the formation of the ESRB, the current video game rating system in North America. The two prominent gaming companies that were represented at this hearing were Nintendo and Sega. At this point, Sega had overthrown Nintendo in the United States, becoming its largest video game giant, and because of that, many believe that Nintendo took these hearings as an opportunity to hurt Sega's image. In general, Nintendo's games were more kid-oriented, and Nintendo had stricter policies regarding violence. For instance, the the SNES version of Mortal Kombat had removed the blood from the arcade game, while the Genesis version did not. One of the games that was discussed in the first hearing was Night Trap, a Sega CD game that was controversial for its perceived suggestive and violent themes. When this game was brought up in the hearing, Howard Lincoln, Nintendo's chairman at the time, proudly claimed, Let me say for the record, I want to state that Night Trap will never appear on a Nintendo system, basically making Nintendo devoid of all responsibility and allowing Sega to take the fall instead. Ironically, Night Trap did eventually appear on a Nintendo system, as the 25th anniversary edition was released for the Switch in 2018. Masahiro Sakurai Masahiro Sakurai is well known for being the creator of Kirby and the director of the Super Smash Bros. series. However, on March 6, 2018, if you were to Google who created Kirby, you would be met with a picture of someone else due to a glitch. Apparently, this image had been used by a parody account of Sakurai on Twitter, and Google's search engine mistakenly pulled the picture up when trying to display an image of Masahiro Sakurai. The error was later fixed, but for months afterwards, especially leading up to the release of Super Smash Bros. Ultimate, fans would regularly edit his Wikipedia to feature this image of a random man. As for who this guy actually is, I have no clue, but this picture will forever be associated with Masahiro Sakurai. 
E3 2008, while Nintendo's demonstration of Skyward Sword at E3 has become one of their most notorious failures at the show, there is an oddly more bizarre moment at E3 that coincidentally also involves the Wii and its motion controls. At E3 2008, to showcase the upcoming title Wii Music, Nintendo decided to have several of its representatives, including Miyamoto, give a live performance playing various instruments the game offered using Wiimotes. They begin to play the Super Mario Bros. Overworld theme, but the song is barely even recognizable with how many notes the group is missing. The band proceeds to fumble their way through two minutes of music as the crowd awkwardly watches in silence. The whole sequence is just extremely uncomfortable and honestly hard to watch. Wii Music went on to be one of the worst performing titles in the Wii series, and this demonstration certainly didn't help. Banned Super Mario Odyssey Box Art The original box art for Super Mario Odyssey has been slightly altered. The cover features several postcards, showcasing the various kingdoms and outfits from the game. And one of these postcards was changed, as the Sand Kingdom postcard was swapped for a postcard of Mario in the Lake Kingdom. People speculate that this change was made due to Mario wearing his sombrero and poncho outfit, which Nintendo feared would lead to claims of cultural appropriation. While the game still contained the poncho and sombrero outfit, I guess Nintendo figured that changing the box art was worth it because it was a simple enough change. Interestingly, Mario Odyssey wasn't the first time Mario donned this outfit. In the 1990 title Kicks for the Game Boy, Mario makes a brief appearance wearing these exact same clothes while playing the guitar, just as he does in Super Mario Odyssey. Tomodachi Life Same Sex Backlash In 2014, Nintendo released Tomodachi Life in the West. The game was a 3DS title that created social, simulated interactions between Miis. It's a bit like Nintendo's take on The Sims. A large part of the game was the relationships between the Miis and how they interacted with each other, with the word Tomodachi actually translating to friends. Miis could even become more than friends, as the game featured romantic relationships where a romantic interest would be listed as sweetheart under the Miis relationship status. However, this feature was not possible for Miis of the same sex, which led to a lot of backlash from disappointed fans who felt that this decision was discriminatory and that Nintendo should strive to be more inclusive. Nintendo ended up releasing a an official statement in response, saying, We apologize for disappointing many people by failing to include same-sex relationships in Tomodachi life, promising to be more inclusive in the future. Miitopia is 18+. Following the release of Tomodachi Life, Nintendo went on to release Miitopia, a role-playing fantasy adventure game that once again incorporated the use of Miis. It's a silly game that shows cartoonish characters participating in the type of combat that you would expect to see in any other RPG. But what if I told you this seemingly childish game received an 18 plus rating. Well, it did, in Russia. Unlike Tomodachi Life, this game did allow for same-sex relationships. And because of a Russian bill from 2013, media that features same-sex couples automatically gets labeled as adult content. Because the law remains in order, the game was once again given an 18 plus rating when it was ported to the Nintendo Switch in 2021. Seeing the box art for Miitopia with a giant 18 plus icon in the bottom left corner, it's just ridiculous and feels like it should be photoshopped. Vodka Drunkensky. When the Super Punch-Out arcade title released in 1984, it included an opponent named Vodka Drunkensky, who, as you might have guessed, is a Russian character who loves to drink vodka. When the Punch-Out series ended up coming to the NES, Nintendo decided to rebrand the character to Soda Popinski, replacing his love for vodka with soda to avoid controversy. In Punch-Out for the Wii, he will actually begin to drink soda mid-fight, allowing you to punch him while he's off guard. It's honestly weird how virtually every character in Punch-Out is a stereotype of their nationality, yet Nintendo decided to draw the line at alcohol. Also, the character's laugh from the NES game was randomly reused in Zelda 2 as Ganon's laugh during the game over screen. Yoshi almost drowned. Through the late 90s and 2000s, a lot of Nintendo's marketing included real people dressed up as their characters. For instance, we've all seen the iconic 1999 Smash 64 commercial that features a bunch of Smash characters violently bashing each other on the head. Well, a 2002 commercial for Mario Party 4 almost resulted in a far more violent ending. During the filming process, one of the actors, dressed in a Yoshi costume, ended up falling into a pool on set. The costume became extremely heavy as it began to sink while absorbing water, and when the actor raised his hand for help, the film crew mistook this gesture for a thumbs up. The crew did end up pulling this actor out of the pool to rescue him, but Yoshi almost met a terrible fate that day. An image from the aftermath eventually surfaced, and you can see Yoshi 
suffer as a traumatized Luigi stands over him, blankly staring at the camera in shock. The whole thing is pretty absurd. Fire Temple Chant The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time's Fire Temple has two different themes depending on the version of the game you're playing. You see, as Koji Kondo was composing the Fire Temple's theme, he decided to include a repetitive chant in the background, which was taken from a publicly available sound bank. Koji Kondo simply thought the chant would fit well with the Fire Temple's theming. In fact, he composed the entire song around it. What he didn't realize though, was that this chanting sound was actually a Muslim prayer. Before the game released, Nintendo realized this and decided to replace the song with a similar theme that featured a choir in the background instead to avoid controversy and being viewed as sacrilegious. However, many copies of the game had already been printed, so Nintendo allowed the original copies to make their way to store shelves while also moving on to begin printing the updated copies. Because of this, many early copies of the game still contain the chant, but Nintendo has continued to keep the updated version of the theme in every version of Ocarina of Time that has been released since. Noki Bay Book In Super Mario Sunshine, Noki Bay's Red Coins in a Bottle mission is linked to one of the most peculiar mysteries in gaming. By sinking to the bottom of the bottle and exploring the structure, you can find a locked door. By adjusting the camera, you will see an odd book sitting behind it. Because the book is inaccessible, many players have wondered why it's there at all. This has led to many theories, from this originally being part of a mission where you took the book to the Noki Elder for a shine, to it opening up an entire secret world, to the book containing Japanese text that reads, you have no life, and is signed by Shigeru Miyamoto himself. None of these have been confirmed, and it still remains a mystery today. Whether this book was actually planned to be part of a mission, or if it was simply an unused texture that got misplaced, we may never know. Every copy of Super Mario 64 is personalized. Every copy of Super Mario 64 is personalized was the final topic on the famous Super Mario 64 iceberg. The iceberg that went on to create this viral subgenre of videos that you happen to be watching right now. This iceberg was much more lore and creepypasta based, with thought-provoking subjects like a supposed 1995 unreleased build of the game, Wet Dry World's negative emotional aura, and of course the Wario apparition. But the most well-known one from this iceberg is by far the phrase, every copy of Super Mario 64 is personalized. Supposedly, every copy of the game is personalized to your mind. Do you ever get a weird feeling when running around in someone else's save file? Like, something's off? It's like the game doesn't want you there. Personally, this theory makes no sense to me, but I appreciate the creativity of it all. Super Mario 64 is a game that is ingrained in all of our minds from a young age, and sometimes our minds do weird things looking back on old memories. Either way, every copy of Super Mario 64 is personalized, plus the rest of the Super Mario 64 iceberg, deserves a spot in the Internet Hall of Fame, and it just made sense to commemorate it here on our iceberg. Slamfest 99 Remember the aforementioned trailer for Super Smash Bros where the iconic characters duke it out in real life? Well, Nintendo actually made this idea its own entire event. Super Smash Bros Slamfest 99 was an event held in Las Vegas to promote the upcoming release of the first Smash title. It featured the same four costume characters from the commercial, having them fight in a giant wrestling ring. This entire event could be watched live on the internet through Real Player G2 and was even available to watch for months afterwards. Yet no footage from the event seems to exist anymore and it's largely considered to be lost media. Due to the obscurity of the event, many Nintendo fans have wanted to understand more about it, looking for any information they can find. And earlier this year, several photographs from the event were compiled and made available on the Lost Media Wiki. The images show about everything you'd expect. Four people in Nintendo costumes running, jumping, and diving around on a stage, trying to recreate a traditional wrestling match. Rob was a Trojan horse. After the crash of the video game market in 1983, retailers were hesitant to adopt new consoles in fear that they would underperform and lead to lost sales. Nintendo was well aware of this, and so as the NES made its way to North America, they marketed it alongside Rob, the robotic operating buddy who would interact with the console in certain games. The idea was to market the product as an enhanced toy rather than just a video game to make stores more comfortable when selling it. Thanks to Rob, the NES was adopted by several retailers, and eventually became so popular that it is often credited with saving the entire video game industry in North America. Because of its history, Rob is often referred to as a Trojan horse, as it was able to infiltrate the toy industry while really just being a way to get video games into stores. Nintendo Switch saved a kidnapped child. In the summer of 2022, an unidentified teenager sparked an FBI investigation after she had gone missing for several days. No one knew anything about her whereabouts until a friend noticed 
noticed her Switch profile was set to online. The friend ended up sharing this information with authorities in hopes that it would help them with the case. Well, by collaborating with Nintendo, the FBI was able to track the IP address of the Switch and pinpoint the girl's location. Apparently, a 29-year-old man she had met online had kidnapped her and transported her over 2,000 miles away from her home. Thankfully, after the girl had been missing for 11 days, the FBI was able to rescue her and bring her back to her family, all because of her Nintendo Switch. Welcome to the sea floor. The final 20 facts of the iceberg feature by far the most explicit, inappropriate, and adult content we've ever featured on the channel. The final section of this video is not for kids and viewer discretion is advised. Animal Crossing Slur Animal Crossing Wild World allowed for user-generated catchphrases that your villagers could use and call you as a nickname. The game also had a feature that allowed these user-generated catchphrases to be spread wirelessly from game to game. This was all wholesome fun and just a way to make your game more personalized to you. But three years after the game's release, Nintendo was releasing Animal Crossing City Folk on the Wii. In order to demonstrate item transfer from DS's Animal Crossing Wild World to the Wii's Animal Crossing City Folk, Folk, Nintendo sent different copies of Animal Crossing Wild World to the press so that they could get their hands on this new feature while covering the Wii release. Unfortunately, the copies that Nintendo sent out included a less than favorable catchphrase. While it's unknown how this got there, the fact remains that Nintendo sent out copies of Animal Crossing Wild World to members of the press in which your villagers could have a chance of saying a racial slur. Naturally, Nintendo immediately apologized and recalled all these copies, and while it seems like this was clear clearly just a mistake on Nintendo's part. Given the company's family-friendly nature, and even more so within the Animal Crossing series, this is a crazy thing to have happened. Nintendo predicts 9-11. In the 1993 Super Mario Bros. movie, the two dimensions of dino Hatton and Manhattan merge together. During this, Koopa's tower takes over where the World Trade Centers were, and the crude animation that plays bears a striking resemblance to the 2001 September 11th terrorist attacks. Additionally, when introducing controller rumble to the mainstream during the N64 era, Nintendo obviously had to file many patents for the rumble path. Figure 14 of these patents was used to show how the rumble would kick into effect when a playable object hits a stationary object. In this patent illustration, it's shown to be a plane crashing into a building. At the time, this was meant to be a simple diagram to demonstrate a potential in-game event, but it's definitely quite odd to look back on. Mario's Member There's a Super Mario Bros. manga that released from 1988 to 1998. This manga was officially licensed by Nintendo and a relatively standard affair. Mario would go on different adventures, all pretty standard stuff. However, the first volume of this officially licensed manga had a section where Mario lost his pants. The artists, instead of deciding to tastefully hide Mario's private parts by obscuring them with another object, decided it was a good idea to show off Mario's genitalia for the whole world to see, and Nintendo signed off on this. This was an officially licensed panel. Granted, this was from 1988, but Nintendo would rather be caught dead than allowing this to happen now. Super Horneo Bros. Super Horneo Brothers and Super Horneo Brothers 2 are two 1993 pornographic parodies of the Super Mario video game that were released at around the same time as the series' first official film, Super Mario Bros. Pornographic parodies are nothing new, even for Nintendo-related content. However, Super Horneo Bros. must have been relatively successful as it did also spawn a sequel. Nintendo got so upset at this that they bought up the rights to both films to halt distribution indefinitely. Actor Ron Jeremy, who starred in both films noted in an interview later on that buying up porn parody rights to halt distribution is quote unheard of in the porn industry. So Nintendo owns two Mario Bros porn films to this very day. Pearl Harbor. Splatoon introduced two idols, Callie and Marie, who formed a band named the Squid Sisters. These characters were extremely popular, would introduce maps and updates to the player, and were featured in the game's single player campaign. Splatoon 2's idol band is called Off the Hook, and was also extremely popular. It features a inkling named Pearl and a octoling named Marina. Given that the word Marina is a direct synonym for the word harbor, fans quickly began drawing parallels to the 1941 Japanese surprise bombing of Pearl Harbor military base in Hawaii. It's extremely unlikely that this was intentional on Nintendo's end, as it just makes no sense for them to do this sort of thing. But given how Nintendo does like to stay out of controversy, it's kind of odd that they named two characters Pearl and then Marina, which means harbor. 
Love Hotel. Before entering the video game market with the Nintendo Entertainment System, Nintendo did a bunch of different things. One of them being owning and operating 1960s Love Hotels in Japan. These are extremely cheap hotels that are primarily used for giving guests privacy for intimate activities. Naturally, there's not a lot of information on these business activities at all, which has led to some more recent people saying this isn't true. Despite the fact that many news sources have reported on this as being true, however, my own research has tracked back almost every claim to this one book, Game Over written by David Sheff and published in 1993. Sheff does seem to be knowledgeable about Nintendo, so take with that what you will. Yakuza dealings. After Japan closed off all contact with the Western world in 1633, foreign playing cards were banned. In the centuries following, different types of playing cards would often pop up in Japan, but they were promptly banned by the government for being used in gambling. This led to card manufacturers having to think outside of the box, and Hanafuda cards were born. These cards were more pieces of art than actual playing cards. They just had pictures on them, no numbers, and hence no ban. As Nintendo eventually became Japan's biggest Hanafuda card manufacturer, the Yakuza were one of their biggest customers as they used Hanafuda cards to gamble frequently. It's highly likely that the Yakuza kept Nintendo in business for many years by purchasing these cards to gamble with. Legend of Zelda NES Level 3 The Legend of Zelda for the NES is comprised of many different screens that when pieced together result in an overworld map. When stitching together the screens of Level 3 of the game or the third dungeon, you see that the overall layout is very similar to a left-facing swastika. While any sort of swastika iconography is definitely not intended to be used by Nintendo, as the vast majority of the public associates it with Hitler's rise to power in Nazi Germany, the left-facing version is actually a sacred symbol in most Buddhist traditions, so this definitely isn't the worst thing in the world. Olimar smokes weed. In Pikmin 2, there's a treasure called the Arboreal Frippery. In the PAL version, it's a red maple leaf from the Japanese maple tree, but in the NTSC and Japanese versions, it looks a lot like marijuana. This goes to being a visual similarity to all but confirmed thanks to Olimar's journal entry in the Japanese version. It's stated that the treasure has hypnotic properties and Olimar states that he might even want to use it one day. Waluigi Wiggler Tweet On the 22nd of April 2015, Nintendo of America's Twitter account put out the following. Reply WA for hashtag Waluigi Wednesday and reply with a flower emoji for hashtag Wiggler Wednesday with a cute image of Waluigi riding a plush Wiggler. Unfortunately, this goes from just being a simple tweet meant to farm engagement to one of the most bizarre missteps in Nintendo social media history by forgetting one simple letter. This tweet was naturally quickly deleted, and a mere hour after it came out, Nintendo had already issued an apology saying, when tweet about one of our characters, we missed a letter. Oops, sorry about that. Ocarina of Time Groomer Theory Towards the end of Ocarina of Time, you reach the Chamber of the Sages and awaken Noboru as the Spirit Sage. She ends up giving you the Spirit Medallion before the screen fades to white and we get this extremely odd text. If only I knew you would become such a handsome man, I should have kept the promise I made back then. Given that in Ocarina of Time, you start off as a kid and then become an adult, which is what Link is during this scene, it can be inferred that Noboru made certain remarks to Link as a kid and now wishes that she had followed through with whatever she said now that she sees how attractive he is as an adult. This is straight up grooming. There's no other way to put it. Link was getting groomed. Very, very odd to see this in a Nintendo game at all. And and yeah, I mean, it's just, we wouldn't see this today. Link was getting groomed in Ocarina of Time. That's just how it was. Vaporeon. There are over a thousand Pokemon. However, the water evolution for Eevee, Vaporeon, is the unfortunate subject of a copy pasta called Most Breedable Pokemon. I won't go into it here as it's just disgusting, but it's pretty much exactly what it sounds. Regardless whether or not this original post was meant to be ironic, it immediately became a copy pasta being shared around for the pure absurd nature of the content, and you can look it up at your own risk. Mario Kart Arcade GP Terrorist Photo In the files of Mario Kart Arcade GP, there are three pictures in the game's files, labeled Camtest 00, Camtest 01, and Camtest 02. These are images likely used to test the game's camera, which could take a picture of a player and then present that as an icon above their racer. However, Camtest 02 is a picture from the Beslan School Hostage Crisis, a tragic terrorist attack which took place in September of 2004, where approximately 1,300 people were taken hostage by armed 
armed Islamic separatist militants. Over 400 of them were killed and almost 800 were injured. This is an incredibly tragic event where hundreds of people lost their lives. A random news picture from this event being included in the files of every Mario Kart arcade GP cabinet is bizarre. It's something I didn't believe at first and just makes you ask so many questions. Hold your Wii for a Wii. 107.9 KDND was a Sacramento, California radio station, which in January of 2007 held a contest dubbed Hold Your Wii for a Wii. At this time, the Wii was one of the hottest items you could purchase in America. That is, if you could purchase it. It was flying off store shelves and shortages made it almost impossible for anyone to get their hands on the console. Approximately 17 to 20 contestants were given 8 ounce water bottles at 15 minute intervals, and whoever ended up drinking the most, without having to go to the bathroom, would receive the coveted Nintendo console. This included contestant Jennifer Strange, who may have drank nearly two gallons of water according to witness reports. Unfortunately, this kind of bizarre story has a tragic ending, as Jennifer called a co-worker on her way home from the contest claiming to suffer an intense headache. Her co-worker contacted her mother, who went to her home an hour later and found her deceased. Jennifer Strange received second place in the contest, but paid the ultimate price and left behind her husband and three children. Children. This was absolutely tragic, and obviously a terrible idea on the radio station's behalf. So the aftermath included 10 firings, the immediate ending of the program The Morning Rave, in which this contest was held on, and $16.5 million awarded to the survivors of Jennifer Strange after a wrongful death lawsuit was filed on behalf of her husband and three kids. Kirby Naked Girl. Level 5 of Red Canyon in Kirby's Dream Land 2 has a secret area which is said to be a crude pixelated drawing of a naked woman. You can't see this all on screen at once, but if you stitch together all the blocks in the level, you get this image. Is it actually crude pixel art of a naked woman, or just an unintended artifact of the way the developers wanted to design the area? You can decide. Nintendo Sex Ed Tape. On June 4th, 2007, the lost Nintendo Sex Ed Tape was uploaded to YouTube by V2Tom. This is is an incredibly elaborate troll featuring extremely high quality animations, hilarious voice acting, and a very off-putting vibe that almost makes it seem somewhat real, but it's very clearly fake. Again, this was uploaded in 07. This is the very early days of YouTube. Trolls and hoaxes like this were not commonplace, and people didn't have the mentality of, oh, this is probably fake, so many fans actually ended up believing this. It's one of the most well-made and bizarre Nintendo hoaxes of all time. Hanging Luigi. In the original Luigi's Mansion for the GameCube, there are certain specific situations where you'll see a hanging shadow of Luigi. This creepy phenomena resulted in many fan theories, including one where Luigi had hung himself and the events of Luigi's Mansion 1 are just being played out in the afterlife. Fortunately for our favorite green plumber, this seems to just be a glitch in the game's lighting engine which displaces Luigi's shadow in certain situations. Not at all an intentional easter egg or reference of Luigi having hung himself as many believe. Proving this point further, this glitch was nowhere to be found in the port of Luigi's Mansion for the Nintendo 3DS. World War II Propaganda During the Second World War, it was not uncommon at all for companies to try and sway the public's opinion in their country's favor through the use of marketing, otherwise known as propaganda. In October of 1943, Nintendo released a backgammon board that was intended for kids but featured several images promoting Japan's involvement in the Second World War. Arguably the most interesting image on this board is number 9 as a rabbit and a turtle dressed up in Japanese military uniforms are waving the Japanese flag as a British and American flag lay tattered at the bottom of the hill. Obviously, this was way back in 1943. This really has no tangible connection to the Nintendo we currently know and love, but the fact that this same company did support the Axis powers and released propaganda no less, it's definitely odd. Foxconn Child Labor. Foxconn was a company that Nintendo contracted to manufacture Wii U consoles. Some of these consoles were being manufactured in their Yantai China factory, where news broke that Foxconn was using child labor. Children as young as 14 were employed, and Nintendo then started their own investigation. Foxconn had, quote, moved quickly to ensure that all affected individuals no longer work at Foxconn, and from a PR perspective, this all blew over. It's definitely odd to think, though, that your Wii U could have been made using child labor. 
Jinx. Jinx is Pokemon number 124 in the original Kanto Pokedex. And while this is what Jinx looks like now, previously Jinx looked like this. This original design of Jinx was repeatedly heavily criticized for resembling blackface, with many articles coming out at the time claiming as such, and since then the Jim Crow Museum of Racist Memorabilia has listed Jinx as an example of racism in modern material. Game Freak naturally changed these designs, and the changes later appeared in the Pokemon anime too. However, it can't be denied that Jinx's original design likely stems from a place of extreme racism and prejudice. And just like that, you have reached the end of the ultimate Nintendo iceberg with over 200 facts and stories about Nintendo. Thank you guys so much for watching. This was an absolutely massive project. And if you made it this far, please just drop a like or a comment or something to help boost this video. It seriously does mean the world. Massive thank you to Mac and Kagan for also undertaking this massive project. And if you enjoyed this video, click here to watch another 1,000 facts. Yes, 1,000 facts about Nintendo.